Last summer, uh, shortly after I arrived here, um, in, our, in one of the first conversations that President Daniels and I had, we talked about a whole host of things, um, including the changing landscape for arts and culture, particularly in the United States, um, and, and as a separate matter, the importance of Peabody as the old conservatory um, being a convener in a sense of conversations, much in the way Hopkins is. Uh, known to be, and a leader. And it's one, one, of, the, one of these two components, um, the importance of the topic in our field and the importance of Peabody being in this conversation is, of course, partly what this is about today. And uh, we had a lot of support from uh, President Daniels uh, for the symposium. Um, and I want to thank him and also ask him to step forward and make a few comments and welcome all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. It's so great to be here, and I want to thank our panelists, our faculty, students, and staff for dedicating the time to participate and indeed animate this very important conversation that you're about to have. I know that we're convening a symposium here to talk about the future of classical music and Peabody's role within that landscape. But before we look to the creative disruptions ahead of us, I thought it might be useful to pause for a moment and look back, roughly indeed 100 years back, to the Paris premiere of the ballet performance of the Rite of Spring. Now, as many of you know, this landmark collaboration between one of the 20th century's great composers, Igor Stravinsky, and choreographer Václav Nijinsky was so unsettling, so jarring, to audiences that a riot literally broke out in the aisles. And people didn't know uh, what was more shocking, the primitive style of the dance, or the unprecedented musical expressions of a bassoon that, simply put, didn't sound like itself. So much for the 20th century sensibility. Now, in a recent interview, famed conductor Michael Tilson Thomas said of the event that Parisians would have expected to see something bright, colorful, exotic, with lots of leaping, lots of diaphanous costumes that would give you occasional glimpses, lovely glimpses of gorgeous anatomy. And that's not what they got. Instead, what they saw was something right on the edges of what was comprehensible at that time to the musicians and the public. In the succeeding years, of course, Stravinsky's work has been hailed as a masterpiece and has become part of the canon of 20th century classical music. And at the time, in the words of one musicologist, it shattered expectations. Now, of course, today, I'm not anticipating that, uh, that riots will break out in the aisles of Peabody, or at least not until after I leave the event. <laughs> Yet we are, in a very real sense, gathered in the same spirit as Stravinsky's audience was so many years ago. I think it's fair to say, too often and perhaps for too long, we have viewed classical music and indeed the institutions that foster it with certain set expectations. Today, I think we're here, led by Fred, to have our expectations, if not shattered, then certainly challenged and stretched. We're here to wrestle with the probing questions of the future of this art form and the role of institutions like Peabody that shape and interpret it. And at the dawn of the 21st century, we're being asked to draw on our understanding of the past to inform creative thinking about the future. How can, and indeed must, musical education change to produce artists for the 21st century? What form? will our musical artist careers take? How can we help them to be more entrepreneurial in crafting, shaping, anticipating the world in which they're going to forge their careers? What are the expectations of a conservatory like Peabody and other institutions for engaging in and supporting and sustaining not only the cultural opportunities, but also the economic prospects of the city it calls home? Grappling with these questions and arriving collectively at an imaginative solution or solutions is very much part of the Hopkins ethos. We are a place, as you know, that was born of a creative experiment to rethink higher education in America. 
and we were tremendously successful in birthing the idea of the American Research University, a model that has been emulated literally throughout the world. And this is the legacy of which Peabody is an essential part. And we are a place willing to do the hard work of innovating to meet the challenges ahead. Today, Peabody is embodying that grand tradition to the fullest. It plays a crucial role in the constellation of our university, helping us to explore the complexities of our world and give expression, musical expression, to the joys and struggles that define us. I'm honored today that we're joined by such a great group of panelists, indeed, uh, many of the nation's leaders in arts and music programming, performance and philanthropy, to help us investigate, illuminate, and dream together about the future of classical music and the role of this great, important institution in creating it. I know this will be a productive, probing, and hopefully expectation-shattering conversation, and one that I hope marks the first of many more to come. I want to thank you all for being here, and I want to take just a, one final moment to do a shout out to our now still very new, indeed our first Dean of Peabody, Fred Bronstein. Uh, I want to thank you, Fred, for convening this group. I want to thank you for uh, playing a role in leading not only a local, but indeed the national conversation around these subjects. But most of all, I just want to say on behalf of all of us, and. Uh, at this uh, very important moment in the life of Peabody. Thank you for being here and lending your leadership to uh, Peabody. With that, I turn the program back to Fred. Thank you. Thank you, Ron, and, and thank you. And also just, Rob and I were just commenting, we see the panelists have these great chairs. <laughs> the audience has these great chairs. And you got these two bridge chairs for Rob and I. I don't read anything into that. That's that's not that's okay. We'll get you one of those chairs. I'm gonna go. Get yeah. it. Uh, thank thank you, Ron, and, and thank you for all your support of Peabody. And uh, I'd like to ask Rob Lieberman, of course, the provost, to to come up. Uh, Rob is is also a great supporter of Peabody, and I think also, um, as I think many of you know, has a very deep personal connection to music and interest in music. And I know that he is. Um, has some words for you as well. Rob? Thanks. Thanks, Fred. Um, when I was uh, considering coming to Johns Hopkins to take this job, in fact, one of the things that I found so appealing about Hopkins and about coming here was the Peabody Institute and that Peabody is such a part of, uh, such an important part of this great university. Peabody and the art that's created here every day, every hour of every day, makes such an important contribution to our university, to the city, and to all of those affiliated with it. And it makes me really proud and very excited not just to be here today, but to be a part of this great institution. As, um, as Fred mentioned, uh, music has been long an important part of my own life. I actually studied uh, bassoon um, when I was uh, considerably younger. And it's interesting, Ron, that you tell the story of Stravinsky and uh, Nijinsky and uh, the Rite of Spring. Um, I'm fairly certain that my own gift with the bassoon also may have been viewed as an unprecedented musical expression, <laughs> just not quite in the same way. And in fact, when I was a member of the Yale Symphony Orchestra a bajillion years ago, we actually performed the Rite of Spring um, at one of the concerts that I was in when I was there. And uh, fortunately for everyone concerned, for my own nerves and for the audience's enjoyment, I was playing second bassoon, so my colleague in the first chair actually got to perform the solo um, at the opening of the piece um, that, that uh, Ron referred to, and it really worked out better for everyone that way. Um, I should also say that music also led me to my wife. We met uh, singing in the Yale uh, Glee Club, really about which the less said the better. Um, and my children um, uh, spend a lot of time here, even though we're very new to Baltimore, already taking music lessons and participating in orchestra chamber music here at the prep. So for me personally, the journey to Baltimore and to Johns Hopkins have been greatly enriched by Peabody. Um, but more importantly, um, I want to just take a moment to celebrate Peabody's importance to Johns Hopkins. We believe strongly in the power of music in the uh, humanity that it brings to the university, to our pursuits, to our pursuit of excellence um, across the board. And just as there is enormous opportunity in what Peabody brings to Hopkins, 
there's also enormous opportunity for the university, for the city, and for the world of classical music in the exploration that's happening at Peabody today. Um, and as Ron uh, said, we're gathered here today for what I fully expect will be an expectation-shattering uh, conversation. Peabody, um, under Fred's leadership, is in the process of reshaping and really reimagining what it is, what it can offer, what we as a university can offer to young musicians, to our community here in Baltimore, to the university, and to the whole field of classical music. Uh, this opportunity that we're seizing right now uh, um, um, is really an opportunity to recalibrate the curriculum, to consider how we can better prepare students, not just for the musical world of today, but for the world as it might exist in 10, 20, 30 years or more in the future. We need really to give our students the tools to lead the way into the future of classical music, and that's what brings us to this uh, discussion here today. I'm very, very excited to hear our uh, panelists' discussion, to hear your questions, um, and to hear what I hope will be the beginning of a very fruitful and forward-looking dialogue. Uh, the, symbos the symposium really marks an important moment um, in Peabody's history and the university's history. It's a day that will guide and shape what a Peabody education, and indeed what a great university that embraces an institution like Peabody can and should look like in the years to come. So uh, I want to really thank the panelists um, also uh, for making time for this conversation. Thank you all for joining us today. We will take a moment to reset the stage and then begin the discussion. Thanks very much. So um, the first thing I want to do just before we launch into, into questions is just take a moment to uh, thank, we had a, a little committee that worked on putting this symposium together, um, and I want to just give a shout out to the folks that served on that. Uh, faculty members Michael Hirsch, Michael Cannon, Gary Louie, and then our, uh, on the administrative side, Andrea Trishuzzi, uh, Paul Matthews, Tim Holt, and Mary Beth Walker, and a special thank you to Mary Beth, who really did yeoman work in putting all of this together, and uh, so thank you. I also, of course, you know, are, am thrilled with the panel we have here today, and you're going to have a chance to hear lots from them, but just a couple of quick comments. Um, going al alphabetically here now, Marin also, Marin is, of course, the music director of the Baltimore Symphony, uh, world-renowned conductor, um, educator, and, and I would still say trailblazer, um, because what, it's now nine, ten years? Have you been at BSO? Eight, year, eight years, eight, <laughs> eight, eight years, and, and still the, um, the sole um, uh, sitting female conductor of a major orchestra. So, I, 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 I know, I know that, I know that, I know that's not a distinction that you that you. She'll probably get mad at me for saying that, but but it makes a point. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so also we have Ben Cameron. Um, ben is. Um, the head of arts programming at the Doris Duke Charitable Trust. And those of you who have ever had an opportunity to watch his TED Talks presentations, they are, they are really riveting, and I suspect we'll get a little bit of that today. I'm, I'm, I'm counting on that. Um, we also have uh, Thomas Dolby. Uh, Thomas, I think, as, as many of you know, is one of the early trailblazers on MTV, uh, music director of the TED Talks, you may not know that. Um, and very much somebody always on the cutting edge of, of music and technology. Um, he's also the newly appointed professor of arts at Johns Hopkins University. He's teaching a film on music class. I think about two thirds of your students, you said, are Peabody students, which is great. Uh, and you're very involved with the Station North project, so we're delighted you're here and on campus, um, Thomas. Uh, we then have also uh, to my right, we have Marina Piccinini, who is well known to everybody here. Marina is, of course, a world-renowned flutist and a faculty member here at Johns, at Johns Hopkins Peabody. And finally, over here on the far right, we have uh, Jesse Rosen. Um, I've known Jesse a long time. He is the uh, CEO of the League of American Orchestras, deeply involved in, in orchestra issues and the complexity of that field and industry. Um, and is, I think, also a very thoughtful 
person when it comes to not just issues as they pertain to orchestras, but as they pertain to culture and arts generally. So um, with that, again, thank you all for being here. And I, I think probably maybe the, the best way to start is I'd like to just ask each of you to take two to three minutes um, and tell us what you think is next for classical music. Uh, and, and in doing so, I guess what I'd like to ask you to say is what, what, is, the, what is your biggest hope about that? And what, is, what do you see as the single largest obstacle to that? So um, maybe we can, let's start over here with Jesse. Well, the, the short answer is I don't know. Um, but I'm not worried about not knowing because um, there are quite a few things that give me a lot of hope. One of them in particular has to do with the current generation of young musicians who I think are um, redefining many of our uh, understandings about what it means to be a musician, what is the relationship music has to an audience, to a place, uh, how musicians relate to their own destinies, how they relate to their own uh, leadership, and their own governance of the organizations that they're part of. And that gives me enormous hope. Uh, a second thing that gives me enormous hope is the amount of creativity in composition in the United States today, which I think is more varied than it's ever been before and continues to to grow and also continues to find a uh, connection to our audiences today. We, I think we're coming out of a period in the 1960s through the 1980s of a tremendous uh, separation between the work of living composers and audiences and I think we're really doing a great job of bridging that. Um, what I worry about and one of the concerns I have has to do with what seems to be a need to continually redefine and rethink why classical music matters. Um, for a long time, we didn't have to answer this question. The uh, manager of the Boston Symphony reports that back in the 1960s, their subscription campaign amounted to a one-page letter sent to subscribers with nothing on it except dates. No artists, no repertoire, and the Boston Symphony was sold out on subscription. Um, our latest data indicates a 29% drop in subscription sales in American orchestras over the last 10 years. Times have changed, and they've changed really dramatically, and I think we're going to need all of our efforts to uh, figure out how to run our organizations and answer the questions about what's our role uh, in American society today. Marina? I think Whatever I might be better. Do. No, I, um, I guess I'm really happy that you say you don't know because I kind of have to confess I felt like a fraud being here. I'm not a head of an uh, in institution or an arts organization. I am a musician and I spend my days um, practicing, studying, <laughs> collaborating, um, and uh, I have you know, a narcissistic need to perform like most of us performers and I teach. So I feel that my, uh, to answer the question what's next for music is something that I don't really actually think about that, that clearly. I'm, I feel I'm so involved in the present and the near future of you know, the next couple of years, what I have to finally learn. Um, uh, but actually even having to say what's, what's the present, it's very difficult for me to say what is the state of classical music in the present. I, travel a great deal for my profession. The kids here know that I live in Vienna. Uh, so I'm living in Austria. I teach both here at Peabody, I teach in Germany, and I travel the entire world. I sit on panels. I collaborate with young musicians, old musicians. Um, and I see an awful lot of different things, both uh, when I judge competitions or when I play. And it's really hard to define what's happening because there is a lot happening. And I think that, in a way, is, is also what gives me hope. I don't think that uh, classical music is dead. Uh, I'm living proof of it. When I started uh, performing seriously, what, about 20 years ago, the first thing that I was told by my manager and by my older uh, colleagues was that it was really difficult uh, now to find uh, concerts, and it had been a lot easier in the 80s and probably in the 70s and the 60s and the 50s. It's been hard all along, and I have to say, for me personally, it's easier now than it used to be before, so I think it's getting better. Um, when I travel, I see uh, a lot of expansion. Uh, I've gone to places to play with orchestras where there were no orchestras before. I mean, recently I also heard Singapore Symphony. That's an excellent orchestra that didn't exist a little while ago. 
uh, Marin's uh, orchestra, Ozespi from um, Brazil. I, I grew up in Brazil and I remember this orchestra. The way it plays nowadays is really tremendously different. It's, it's a completely much better, more exciting, much more vivid orchestra. So I see expansion on that. I know orchestras are closing. I just read yesterday about Pennsylvania uh, Philharmonic. Is that what, what was in the paper? So there's a new little orchestra. By the way, they need local Baltimore players. Um, and I see, uh, I see creativity everywhere I go. I just judge the competition, and there are new groups coming out, incredibly inventive, incredibly good. Uh, people do all sorts of strange crossovers. Somebody just sent me a link to Schoenberg Pierre Rollinet with Kabuki Theater in the same breath. And it's exciting, actually. It's really beautiful and it's new. There are new venues. I just played in New York. I was saying uh, this place called the Poisson Rouge, which is basically a basement uh, where they serve drinks and food. <laughs> and it's incredible. People are really wanting to go there. And that's already passé. Now it's the subcultures, the new Poisson Rouge. So venues are also popping up. People are creative, they're inventive. YouTube, you can publish yourself for free. You can, you can do all sorts of things. Technology is, is amazing. So I think there's an incredible uh, amount of creativity and I think that's positive. That excites me. I think the, the, the creative urge in humanity is irrepressible and it will always be and I think there will always be something. What worries me is that um, in the end, I think, especially in the United States, I see this, that the, the success of music, of classical music, is very much tied into the bottom line, the box office, the dollars. Um, I think pop music is, uh, can survive easily uh, the, the idea of, of crowd funding, in a way. It reaches out to a lot of people. Classical music requires a different kind of reflection, a different kind of commitment, a different kind of training, much longer, and it has always relied on patronage ever since, whether the church or sovereign. Um, and if we continue to only think in that way and have to meet those kinds of needs, we will also destroy, I think, the link that we have to the history and the tradition uh, and the excellence and the language. I fear sometimes that we're getting away from the language of understanding our musical language and really preserving the sensibility and the beauty of the art form that we do. Thank you, Marina. Marin? Well, uh, it's great to be here. It's, it's always wonderful to have these discussions. They should probably occur weekly, uh, if not daily. Um, you know, I didn't grow up with many of the uh, advantages that typically define privilege, but I had the greatest advantage of all because my parents were both professional musicians. And so I grew up in a really crazy household, you know, where um, money could not be, you know, cash was never our currency. Um, music was always our currency. And uh, I think that gave me um, a lot of advantages uh, because it wasn't about um, materialism. It was about um, having people over to play chamber music and uh, having a an interpersonal, transcendental kind of moment together, especially after they drank a lot of wine, I noticed when I was young. And uh, I, think, I think, though, growing up in that, um, that kind of environment, for me, um, was really showed me that uh, musicians are, are the most um, fortunate people uh, in terms of profession, because it, it has to be the most entrepreneurial um, uh, discipline out there being a musician because you can put together almost any kind of life for yourself if you're a musician. You know, you don't have to do it any certain way. There's no real formula for um, being successful. I mean, my parents were, when I was accepted to Yale as an undergraduate, my parents were really apoplectic. They, they said, why would you want to go to Yale? I mean, what a waste of four years. You could go to Juilliard, you know? So, you know, what did they know? But here you are at Peabody. So. Um, what can I say? Uh, but to me, um, it's all up to you. It's whatever you want to make it. You have, you have the possibility to put together any kind of life for yourself as a musician, any kind. And the more creative you are, the more proactive you are, the more of a good citizen of the world you are, the better your life will be. 
And that's, you know, it, it's all up to you. And I think being here in Baltimore, and especially at this institution, which is the oldest conservatory in the United States, has a tremendous history, but now with Fred at the helm, it's probably going to be the most entrepreneurial conservatory. You have Johns Hopkins at your disposal, which is one of the great institutions of the world. And to not take advantage of that in some way, whether it's to go and audit a class or go and take a class or go and meet some of those students. I don't see nearly enough of you at the Baltimore Symphony. It's one of the great orchestras of the United States. And if you like music, you really should go hear music all the time. Or, um, or to go and collaborate with some of the young visual artists at Station North. And you know, Baltimore, a friend of mine said, oh yeah, I heard Baltimore's the new Brooklyn. That's awesome, you know? I, I don't, you probably don't get it, but anyway, it was. <laughs> I'm from New York, so I get it. But um, there's a lot happening here that isn't happening in other cities. And so you have this opportunity. Don't become one of these um, old-fashioned, um, entitled musicians, when, especially when you're 20 years old. That's all I can say, you know? You have a chance to make a great life for yourself, so you, it's up to you, really. And uh, I, I can only say that, you know, everyone told me it was impossible of what I wanted to become and what I wanted to do. And, you know, what can I say? Nothing's impossible. Just enjoy the fact that you're a musician because it's, it's much better than cash. Thomas. Thank you, Marin. Uh, a week or so ago, Fred, uh, in the lead up to this symposium, you and I were interviewed by a TV show um, and, uh, Al Jazeera, and the interviewer sat me down and uh, after the the niceties were over, he got a very stern look on his face and said to me, so tell me, Thomas, why are attendances falling for classical music events, and why is nobody downloading classical music from iTunes, and why are CD sales dropping? And it occurred to me that, well, actually, nobody had ever asked me that question before. I would imagine that all of you get asked that question on a fairly frequent basis. Um, so I had to sort of come up with something on the spot, and, and I think I sort of fumbled a bit, but I've, I've given it a lot of thought since. And I think a frustration that I have with um, the classical music world is that it tends to pigeonhole itself as this rather sort of precious, rather uh, elevated form of entertainment. And what you hear very often is that, well, you know, these days people are too busy watching reality TV shows and, and uh, you know, on social media and playing games and sh taking selfies and so on. Uh, we in the classical music world, we stage two, three hour concerts in, in uh, lovely halls and um, people come along and they sit there and listen to our performances and we, we sometimes record them and, and put out CDs and you might catch a performance on PBS and, and so on. It almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that if you view classical music as something removed from uh, what's really going on in popular culture in the world on a day-to-day -day basis, that you're going to exclude exactly the kind of new young audiences that you need in order to keep classical music thriving. And I think that's a big mistake. I think that um, when you look at the, this sort of new inclusive uh, mode of popular behavior that exists in the 21st century, post the internet, post mobile phones, um, which involves the audience, where the audience is not just a passive, um, a passive viewer in a, in a performance, in a, in a broadcast. Um, the 21st century is really all about inclusion. And so all of those things that we worry that our audiences are too busy doing that, to come to our concerts, that's exactly what we need to involve more in the way that we think of ourselves in the classical music world and the way that we promote ourselves. And I think that if you look at this historically, and what better place to do this than in a building that's been around since there was no broadcast, since the since you know 20th, 20th century broadcast media didn't exist, you can see the historical perspective. And that is that you know prior to technology allowing us to record performances and broadcast them from one to many to millions of people via the radio, via the manufacture of records, tapes, CDs, etc. Um, before that existed, classical music could only be enjoyed by as many people as w could get within earshot. And so a couple of hundred years ago, it was really for a very, very elite few, the tiniest echelon at the top of society. 20th century technology allowed us to capture these performances and broadcast them to millions of people. But the 21st century is all about the real-time enjoyment of entertainment 
the loop, the continuous loop between the performers and the audience. And so it's that aspect that classical music has to embrace in order to survive going forward. Thank you, Thomas. Ben. Um, I suppose in the, the spirit of full disclosure, I should just acknowledge I'm the ringer here uh, in terms of I'm not a musician and I don't deal in classical music per se. I work for a foundation where the only musical form we support is jazz. And so I really come to this with an outsider's perspective which probably makes me less informed about these issues than anybody else up here on stage. But as we were talking, I, I realized I began to make, even in this brief set of remarks, uh, uh, I began to parse the question in two ways. If asked what the future of classical music is, I'm incredibly optimistic and think that classical music has an unbelievable, unlimited horizon ahead of it, especially if we take the expanded definition that Thomas just, has just offered us about what classical music is and we get out of pigeonholing it based on composers and centuries. And I, I think that the American public demonstrates in an ongoing way its appetite and receptivity for classical music by the number of people who don't know that they know Carmina Burana, who don't know that they love the United Airlines theme song, which is Rhapsody in Blue, who don't know that they love the whatever airline it is that has the Lock May duet, et cetera. And, and for my generation, the British Airways. British Airways. I should have known. <laughs> And for my generation, we have the sort of same thing because we all grew up with classical music on uh, Bugs Bunny cartoons. And so before I knew who Wagner was, I knew, Oh, Brunhilde, you are so lovely. Yes, I know it. I can't help it. Da, 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 da. You know, so. Uh, so when it comes to classical music, I think we have an incredibly robust and vibrant future ahead. When it comes to classical symphony orchestras, I'm less sanguine. Um, I grew up in the 50s and 60s at a time when the nonprofit arts industry was exploding, when we went from, my, my background is theater, from 20 professional theaters in the country to 2000, where the NEA was invented, and where suddenly orchestras from a handful began to, I think Jesse, you said there are 400 today. And I think we had the luxury of growing up in a time where we, certainly in the theater field, thought we were creating institutions that would allow artists to do what they do best and focus on elevating the quality of their work. There was a term in the theater industry called the artistic home, which was about we should have resident theaters where we give the artist optimal salaries and allow them to go into the rehearsal hall and focus their lives on doing the best work possible. Inadvertently, I think what we have created is a generation of institutions, and I would say that in the symphony case, uh, this was uh, uh, com complicated even more by the creation of endowments, where we've created institutions that fundamentally are insulated from the world in which they exist, and where many of the professionals perform at their communities rather than with their communities or for their communities. And so when I think about the future, I think three things. Number one, I think that the balance of authority is going to shift from the insulated artist to what I call the citizen artist that artist who is really deeply enmeshed in community and thinks aggressively in new forms and new ways and new patterns about making music with their community, for their community, often with people in their community from them. And nothing has cheered me more about symphonies than the courage that some orchestras have, have, have displayed in challenging those assumptions about who plays and for whom. Nobody's challenged it more bravely than Marin has with the Rusty Musicians program here in Baltimore, which has been one of the most inspirational things ever to imagine that a symphony would take that on. And that is huge. When I think, therefore, about the future, I think the future will belong to those who are brave, whether it's Poisson Rouge or the Rusty Musicians or the New World Symphony formats, which are doing mashups and different forums where now people can hold cocktails and mix around the orchestras as they play. We're on the threshold of a fantastic new time. My greatest worry is our passion for my generation, for how deeply meaningful it has been to go into an auditorium like this watch the lights go down and feel a wash of Mahler go over for us. That the passion we hold for that will make us assume that as it has been in our lifetime, thus has it always been, which is a lie, and that it will blind us and lead us to denial to prevent us from undertaking the bold experimentation we need because we'll confuse the symphony, the fate of the symphony with the fate of classical music. Thank you. Um.
Thank you. Ken. Good. <clears throat> those are those are all great opening thoughts. Um, one of the things we're going to try to do in this whole um, afternoon is mix conversation, comments, questions from the audience as well, and a little bit of video. So uh, to that point, I'm going to ask Thomas to tee up um, a uh, video that he put together from his um, work as music director at the TED Talks. Yeah, I, I've, I was the musical director at TED for 12 years. And um, TED, uh, in some ways, illustrates the things that I was talking about a minute ago, because the content at TED, uh, when we first started trying to find a way to expand its audience beyond the five or 600 people that came to the conference every year, we were told by media networks and um, radio stations and programmers and so on that the large scale audience wasn't really interested in esoteric content about genetic research and uh, coral reef exploration and astrophysics and, and so on. And we were told in particular that you know, modern audiences really didn't have the attention span to sit through a 16 minute talk. Uh, that the 16 minutes was a sort of bad chunk of, of time um, for TV channels and so on. And um, over the course of the last decade or so, um, Ted basically managed to sort of prove that there is in fact a huge appetite for that kind of content. And that fans of the Ted Talks, as it turns out, range from you know, young to old, range, you know, different parts of the world, really an incredibly eclectic and, and uh, large spectrum of people have, have become fans of TED Talks. People uh, listen to them on their morning commute, um, they listen to them when they're on their treadmills, um, they listen to them in all sorts of different um, environments. And one of the things that, that has been very popular about them is that the, the content itself feels very pure and unadulterated. Uh, TED is a non-profit, it doesn't have a sort of big corporate agenda, there's no real political agenda to it. It's loosely based um, an effort by a very smart group of people um, to make the world a better place, to come up with ideas uh, despite the, the sort of, um, uh, despite the, 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 the problems that exist uh, with politics, with, with uh, poverty, with disease in the world, that brain power alone could maybe come up with some solutions if it was allowed to be unadulterated. So my job really at TED was to sort of sprinkle some fairy dust on these proceedings and allow people over the course of four or five days um, to get a little bit of breathing space and a sort of palate cleanser between these amazing talks. And we found, and we filmed the, the music that, uh, that we put on at TED, um, and we found to our amazement that many of the musical pieces and the music-related talks became among some of the most successful and most viewed TED Talks that there were. Um, and I think the, this was sort of despite people telling us that, that you know, especially with classical music, with jazz, um, that there wouldn't really be a mass market for that. But I think the fact that we managed to uh, enable it to reach a wide audience sort of tracked in parallel to the fact that we were getting some of these, um, you know, really quite advanced esoteric ideas sort of out to a large viewing public. So I wanted to show you just a little uh, compilation of clips that I put together from musical performances that we did at TED, uh, including musical talks, and explain a little bit why I think we managed to make a success out of them and make some of them go completely viral. So if we could run the video, please, and I'll just give you a little running commentary of, of um, what's going on. Uh, this first piece was by Ted Prize winner Jose Abreu's orchestra, um, in which he won a prize and was awarded some um, funding for, his, uh, for bringing El Sistema to America. So Gustavo Dudamel is conducting, but obviously the story that really broke online was the fact that Abra had taken some street kids and turned them into one of the finest youth orchestras in the world. That is right. In this piece, um, Israeli maestro Itay Talgum is discussing the styles of different conductors. 
Yeah. Well, it is different, but isn't that control in the same way? No, it's not, because he is not telling them what to do. When he does this, it's not take your struggle values and like Jimi Hendrix, <laughs> smash it on the floor. Yeah, it's not that. He says, this is a gesture of the music. I'm opening a space for you to put in another layer of interpretation. Now, if you're doing all the things we, we, we talked about together, and maybe some others, you can get to this wonderful point of doing without doing. If you, if you love something, give it away. as a musician. So when this piece hit YouTube, you wouldn't believe the number of comments from people that couldn't, just incredulous at the fact that Evelyn Glennie is so on, almost well, completely deaf. There's a little bit of a difference there that is worth just... Eric Whittaker composed a choral piece for 2,000 singers using their own webcams and conducted it uh, to great effect. But one of the most successful TED Talks of all time was by Benjamin Zander, whose topic was actually the very same topic we're talking about Probably today. A lot of you know the story of the two salesmen who went down to Africa in the 1900s. They were sent down to find if there was any opportunity for selling shoes. And they wrote telegrams back to Manchester. And one of them wrote, situation hopeless, stop, they don't wear shoes. And the other one wrote, glorious opportunity, they don't have any shoes yet. Now, there's a similar situation in the classical music world, because there are some people who think that classical music is dying, and there are some of us who think you ain't seen nothing yet. So let's see what's really going on here. We have a B. This is a B. The next note is a C, and the job of the C is to make the B sad. And it does, doesn't it? <laughs> Composers know that. If they want sad music, they just play those two notes. But basically, it's just a B with four sads. <laughs> now it goes down to A, and now to G, and then to F. So we have B, A, G, F. And if we have B, A, G, F, what do we expect next? Ooh, the Ted Choir. And you notice, <laughs> you notice nobody is tone deaf. Is that right? Nobody's, you know, every village in Bangladesh and every uh, 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 hamlet in, in, in China, everybody knows. Da, 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 da. Everybody knows who's expecting that E. Now, Chopin didn't want to reach the E there because what will have happened? The nine year old, the nine year old put an impulse on every four notes, and the ten year old on every eight notes, and the eleven year old one impulse on the whole phrase. I, ne I don't know how I got into this position. <laughs> I didn't say I'm going to move my shoulder over, move my body. No, the music pushed me over, which is why I call it one buttock playing. 
There are 1,600 people, I believe. My estimation is that probably 45 of you are absolutely passionate about classical music. You adore classical music. Your FM is always on that classical dial, and you have CDs in your car, and you go to the symphony, and your children are playing instruments. You can't imagine your life without classical music. That's the first group. It's quite a small group. Then there's another group, bigger group. These are the people who don't mind classical music. <laughs> You know, you come home from a long day and you take a glass of wine and you put your feet up, a little Vivaldi in the background doesn't do any harm. Right? That's the second group. Now comes the third group. These are the people who never listen to classical music. It's just simply not part of your life. You might hear it like secondhand smoke at the airport, but, and, and maybe a little bit of a march from Aida when you come into the hall, but otherwise you never hear it. That's probably the largest group of all, because you know my profession, the music profession, doesn't see it that way. They say 3% of the population likes classical music. If only we could move it to 4%. How would you walk? How would you talk? How would you be if you thought everybody loves classical music? They just haven't found out about it yet. <laughs> classical music is for everybody. Everybody. So, uh, you may say to yourselves, well, Ben's a lovely old bird, but he's a... He's a mad dreamer, which he is, of course. Um, but the point is that nearly seven million people got that message that he put across so well, and they were fascinated. And one of the reasons that this worked was that here is somebody taking the lid off what they do. And that's true across the whole of TED. You have experts talking to experts from different fields in a non-condescending fashion, um, they're not talking to, they're not talking above people's heads, nor are they talking down to them. They're just letting their own guards down and explaining what floats their boat. And I think this is a crucial piece of what has enabled talks like this to go vi uh, viral. Because when you watch something like that, even if you're a dentist, even if you're a, a submarine captain, you find something in your experience and your process that somehow intersects and overlaps with what you've heard from the speaker on stage. And so I think it would be really great if we could hear more from the professionals as to what it is that really makes them tick and find ways to use that content and the fascination, the appetite that audiences have for that as a way to create content that will go viral and really start to um, triangulate and multiply around the, around the web. Thank you, Thomas. So, that, so that's, a, that's a great um, segue, actually, to our, to our first big question, which is, which is um, what's the environment for classical music today? What, what is it? Uh, where have we come from? What was it like 25 years ago? Uh, what is it going to be like 25 years from now? How is it evolving? And I think, you know, in sort of getting the conversation going with everyone here now, I, I, you know, issues of technology, societal changes, education, I mean, these are all things that people propose have impacted classical music, and both positively and, I guess, to some extent, negatively. So, um, who wants to take a crack at, at, at this? This is uh, just a quick observation to the videos we just saw. It's hard not to notice those were all old people. Uh, I think mostly people in their, in their 50s and 60s. And um, I think one of the really thrilling uh, things about this moment that we're in is that I think there's a generation of musicians that actually knows everything that we just saw on that screen. And it's, it's I mean, it's wonderfully evocative uh, videos and the, the ability to, um, you know, to have compelling uh, people talk about it, express themselves in beautifully produced videos is fantastic. But frankly, you know, I, I think we're there. I think that the people that I, that the young musicians that I talk to are so there already. And I think the opportunity is really for the institutions to embrace all of the ways in which younger musicians are finding ways to make the connections with the audience, to re reveal more about themselves, to understand the power of a kind of connection that is enhanced and deepened when there's some communication, when there's behind the scenes, the use of the internet, um, you know, there's an orchestra in New York, I think it's still around, called, it was from the Poisson Rouge, uh, was related to it, it was the, the Wordless Music Orchestra, which would do sold out concerts of indie rock and classical music together. And they had no marketing budget, everything was done online. And, um, you know, I think, I think many 
I think many artists get this, and I think from the standpoint of symphony orchestras and, and large institutions, I think where there's great opportunity is to let those artists with their new ways of being um, into those institutions and let the musicians play an active role in helping those organizations evolve so that they actually become part of the 20th, 21st century and not simply a repetition of a lot of ritualistic behavior. I mean, other thoughts on that? Because I think that one of the, one of the things that, just picking up on the note of notion of connection and, and the importance of, of people feeling, feeling personally connected somehow to artists, to the music, what? Well, uh, I just, uh, it's really great to see those videos. I, I've watched, I, I think I've watched all of them uh, several times. I, I, I've contributed to those six million views. Um, but uh, I think their general, their general themes though, I'm, I mean, people say technology and, I mean, they're all tools. It's just a method of um, accessing things. But the great thing is that, uh, that I feel is that people are, um, people are really a lot more curious today because information is m more accessible. So people want to know more and expect to know more and deserve to know more. So it creates an, an, a touch point and an entry point to connect with people. Uh, for example, um, I, I've always spoken at concerts and talked to people about the music and done examples. And, you know, I, I used to be um, chastised really pretty um, violently by managers, by um, orchestra leaders, by everybody for speaking to the audience. And also it um, apparently diminished my um, value as a maestro to talk, actually, especially to speak in English, apparently. So, um, you know, I think that the world has changed a lot. Um, I've, you know, the sad thing is I'm, I'm usually 10 years ahead of the curve, which is not a good thing. If you're two years ahead, you're all right. If you're 10 years ahead, it doesn't work very well. But at least um, I'm, I'm still in the curve now. But uh, at, uh, for example, at concerts, um, our fastest selling series is a, a series called Off the Cuff, where I take a piece apart. We're doing one this week on Ein Heldenleben. And I tear the piece apart and, you know, have the musicians play different parts and talk about the piece and then put it back together. And the, they're sold out, you know, and it's the fastest growing series we have because people really want to know about music. They're curious. Or the rusty musicians that you spoke about, this program, I read a statistic, one of these, you know, dire um, reports about how ticket sales are... You know, diminishing and uh, entries to museums are going down. And, you know, another, but I've been around long enough to know that this is a cyclical discussion and it comes up every, at least every decade, if not more. And, but at the bottom of these statistics, it said, but curiously, the number of people playing instruments has doubled. Because, of course, you can learn how to play an instrument on the internet now. You know, you just Google. Yeah, I, I Googled how to pet a cat the other day. I mean, everything's there, you know? <laughs> and, my cat was not reacting well. I thought, what, what's going on? Anyway, so, um, the, uh, but, so I said, well, if so many people are playing instruments, maybe they want to play with the Baltimore Symphony. You know, my musician said, I mean, this is another whole topic that we could talk about, but, you know, we have, we have a lot of work to do with professional musicians, getting them over a very, very big hump. Part of it is uh, extreme unionization uh, that, you know, and, and that, that's a whole topic. But mus some professional musicians are unwilling to, to move off the dime to be creative and be... And my musicians, when I first told them, listen, I think what we should do is we should invite some non-professionals to play with us. And, you know, some, one of the musicians said, yeah, and, and tomorrow I'm going to perform brain surgery. And I realized that if you're really equating being a musician with being a brain surgeon, something's wrong. Here, you know, because, and anyway, we got, I said, let's just try it. And in 24 hours, we had uh, 400 people sign up, 24 hours. And we just put it on our website. And so they thought it was a good idea. And then they said, well, how will we select the people? I said, oh, but you don't understand. It's not, this is different. This is about having a human experience. It's not about perfection, which we all after, all these things. Anyway, to make a long story short, we have these, very successful rusty musician evenings where people who, who are non-professionals come and play with the musicians. And it's incredibly rewarding. Uh, it doesn't sound so good sometimes, but it's, that's not what it's about. 
It's about connecting with people over music, and that's what all these videos are doing. They're creating touch points. And so, to me, the, the opportunities right now are limitless, and technology is just a vehicle. Let me, let me be a little pro provocative, though, for a second. So, this room out here is full of people, you know it, you know who you are, that are terrified that um, the, the term that's been used is polluted, that, that somehow the, the, you know, the sanctity of classical music is going to change because of audience expectations, delivery systems. And how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you get people there? How do you respond to that, talking to people that are professional musicians or will be professional musicians? This is, a, this is a big issue for people to sort of get their arms around. And this will get into our second question later, so I don't want to jump the gun, but I think I just, just to provoke a little bit of this conversation about that, that particular issue. You mean the that it, the it, brings, it brings the levels the, down by... Correct, correct. That somehow, somehow uh, in doing this, it's, we're encringing upon excellence. Yeah, you know, but this is a whole question of... Um, I mean, my teacher, that was, that was the guy, you know, who wasn't conducting Leonard Bernstein. He was my teacher, you know, and we had a lot of discussions about this highbrow versus lowbrow, you know, and uh, the thing about Leonard Bernstein was he was really fundamentally lowbrow. And uh, he was, and that was the problem everybody, all the critics had with this guy was that he was too lowbrow. But, you know, this is, this is an, a, a place that, I don't know, I just personally, don't want to exist. I mean, I know I have to answer your question, but when we look at when we look at South America, I work in Brazil now, um, which I, was, by the way, I was when I accepted the job, I was told, you know, this is not a career move um, by by my managers, and I couldn't be happier because Brazil is all about enthusiasm and possibility, and very much like Venezuela, um, you know, when I go into a, a school, I, it, it's like I don't know, I'm, it's like Madonna has arrived because all the kids are totally into classical music. And this is a new, ex this is a new landscape, South America. I mean, you have to go there and see what's going on. And you know it's not about perfection. This is the most important thing. It's not about perfection. Sadly, it may ultimately become about perfection for some of them, but music is not about perfection. Music is about emotional experience and connection. And I think, you know, if you want to spend 10 hours a day in your practice room and never go hear the BSO and never go to Johns Hopkins and take a course in world history and talk to another really bright student, you know, you may play more perfect than the next person. And I have no interest in having you in my orchestra because what interests me is people that are engaged and really emotional about what they do. But it's hard because we really, uh, this is a big question, and of course this is probably well, the biggest criticism that I face um, as, as an artist myself, is this question of because I'm accessible and because I want classical music to be accessible, I can't be a great artist, really. Because somehow great art became equatable with unintelligible. If you don't understand it, it must be great. Dan, please. You know, there's a lot of discussion around this, this issue around what audience and public interaction means, and there's a, a, a guy who studies this named Alan Brown who actually codified this as a kind of five-band spectrum who said basically, you know, in the five bands of what it means to interact with the public, there's the performance, there's the, what he called the elaborated performance, which is the performance accompanied by talkbacks or program notes or things like we just saw that, that contextualize or enrich the experience, but essentially the authority remains with the professionals while the audience just watches or consumes. One step over, he said, you have co-curated arts events where the audience plays an active role in the selection of the work to be performed which we're seeing more and more about uh, people saying basically, would you rather hear the, the Beethoven Five or the 1812 or, but the audience has a vested say in which soloist are engaged or whatever. One step over, you have what's called co-created, co like you saw with the Eric Whitaker here or the Rusty Musicians Program where the audience actually plays an active role in the creation of the work itself. And the extreme is the flash mob where the professional basically says, we're letting it go and we're turning it entirely over to the community. You guys run with it. 
And essentially what happens in that spectrum is that every time you take a step to the right, the professional artist has to be willing to deal with an increasing loss of control. And so, and as you move from the left, from the audience, every additional step, you have more interpretive and curatorial say. And that's a spectrum. Uh, uh, basically, in this moment, I've often thought the moment we're in as an arts industry is the equivalent of the religious reformation. We're in the arts reformation. And that's, on the one hand, it's a thrilling time just because it's like new denominations, new practices, new things you can do, new challenges and more and more. But yet, like I always say, the religious reformation did not mean the end of the Catholic Church. A Catholic Church that just three days ago proved that for 600 years they are still largely unchanged by their unwillingness still to admit women to the clergy or embrace gay people in a significant way. And so really, for me, the question is one of intentionality. This five-band spectrum isn't for everybody. But I think what we've got to acknowledge is if you want to be the Catholic Church, if you want to be that musician pursuing unbelievable excellence, there is a place for you just like the Catholic Church. You're going to have less resources. There are going to be fewer of you. There's not going to have the gridlock on dispelling cultural authority that the Catholic Church used to have and no longer has. But you can do that. Contrarily, I think four people thinking or saying, if there's these five bands, where in these bands can I find value? Where can I offer value? And how do I think about more fluidly moving back and forth through the spectrum as time requires? At the heart of the question, I think, which is an instant assumption we make is, we tend to see this future as an either or. And more and more, I think it's a both and. You know, that what we're seeing more and more is that editorial formats are expanding you know, as opposed to, and this will be the last thing I'll say, but you know, there's a guy from the BBC that I just heard named Matlock who was brilliant, who said, you know, we lived in an age of broadcast. TV came out in 30 minute increments. And now we think nobody's got short attention spans. And so Netflix releases all 13 episodes of House of Cards simultaneously. So people go into their apartments, lock the doors and watch TV for 14 hours straight. <laughs> That's an expanded format. Not that TV broadcast went away, it's a both and. And I think for musicians right now, the opportunity is to think about how do I think about the five bands? That doesn't mean I have to let go of my pursuit of excellence. It's an expansion of what I may be called to do. Very good. Thank you. So, uh, you know, actually, I think this might be a good time to, to uh, we'll continue the conversation, but also to see if there are some questions. I'd like to sort of get, the, get some of you all involved and see what your thoughts are, responding to some of what we've heard thus far, uh, but also if you have specific questions for any of the panelists. Any, any takers? Yes, over here. There's a, there are microphones set up, by the way, I think on both sides we have. Uh, my question is directed at uh, Marin. Um, what's something that I'm, I'm a master student in composition right now, and what's something that you see for uh, modern composers that you look for, you find the orchestra looks for, you know, new 21st century techniques? You know, what is what does the orchestra expect out of the the contemporary composer today? Um, well, uh, I think that uh, I think that we we hope for the same thing everyone's always hoped for, really, which is again uh, some kind of um, some kind of emotional journey from your piece, w regardless of what the vocabulary is. I mean, I, I suppose we always looking for some originality in, in your voice and your vocabulary, but I think authenticity is the one thing I'm always looking for in contemporary composers and living composers. And, uh, um, you know, I've, I've worked with a lot of composers who are able to use technology in new ways, like Mason Bates and, and these kind of guys, and I find that pretty intriguing, but to me, if it's, if it's authentic and not, not derivative, but really unique to you, and you have a point of view, uh, I think that those are, again, the most compelling um, attributes. You know, it's not about the, not, at least for me, it's not about the trappings, but it's really about the essence. I, I want to just come back to the question. Do you, do you have a follow-up? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to come back. We'll take another question. Before we do, though, I want to come back to this question of, I mean, is this, we're talking about classical music, but the question I have for the group up here is, is this, 
Is this trend or some of the concerns of the issues that it faces, is it, is, it, is it present in other art forms? Is it present in other entertainment forms? Is this so unique to, to classical music? And do other forms respond better to it than classical music does? So there are really kind of two parts to the question. Thoughts on that? Uh, there's a piece in this morning's New York Times about pop music uh, performances in New York City that are organized um, by a small uh, group of artists where they announce the location of events uh, a very short time before the performance. Nobody's told who's going to be there until uh, they show up or what the sequence of acts is going to be. And um, what they've been doing is creating a community of, of people who are following independent uh, pop artists. And it's completely outside of the uh, organized system for presenting pop acts. In fact, the performances take place in people's lofts. And they're building a huge uh, support for this. And it's just another instance of artists curating themselves, going into different types of venues, a more intimate, more engaged way uh, of connecting with the audience. So I mean, that's just one very timely instance. Marina? Um, I, I'm not very uh, invested in the dance world, but I do know and spend a lot of time in the visual arts. And uh, again, living in Vienna, it's an incredible place. They have amazing museums. And there's an incredible spectrum of, of what is available from you know, the traditional klimts to unbelie unbelievable avant-garde. And I find that uh, actually my feeling as a musician is that in the art world, the response to being in the 21st century is completely further ahead than what we are doing in classical music. I, I see the way that the uh, presentations are done, they're interactive, um, the, the kinds of risks that are being taken and the way it's just communicated to the public. I think we should learn a lot. Risks in content and delivery? In content and delivery, absolutely. And I, and I think that it's always fascinated me why we as uh, musicians are, are not able to do the things that, uh, that, they, that the art world is embracing. And having said that, I don't know, you know a lot more about the, the dance world than I do, I think. And, and I think maybe there's uh, there also a lot of things happening. Well, and actually, where, where the question took me was, I mean, if we, if we take the, the premise that we're largely in a digital age and that that's the most salient power, that really, I think that the digital technology is having three impacts on us. Number one, it's competition. Number two, it's redefining economics. And I think one of the questions all art forms have to consider is, how's an audience going to react when we say that's $100 for a symphony opera or ballet ticket when they're used to downloading culture on demand 24-7 for 99 cents a song or for free? Those dots are not going to connect for very long. And then the third thing is it's changing the nature of consumption because the internet teaches you to believe you can get anything you want any time of day delivered to your own door, whether that's jeans at 3 in the morning cut to your own body that are there within 12 hours or whether you, you order a CD at 5 in the afternoon, whatever. It's that expectation. That's the same forces that is killing booksellers like Barnes and Noble and Borders is gone. There's not a CD store in New York anymore at all. JNR, the last vestige, is gone. Newspapers are in the toilet. They're gone. Three network major distributions are in major trouble. They're about to go. I mean, it's not just the arts. This is redefining the very nature of consumption and retail in the world at large, and everybody's scrambling to figure out how to monetize it and survive it. There's a real question. I used to work in retail for Target stores. There's a real question about how long the physical stores are going to exist in retail. You know, so I think the groups that are really having the most push in an interesting way are the groups that are standing back, not saying, how do we adapt and see technology as a tool? I think they're doing two things. Number one, they're saying, how do we develop a digital mindset? And a digital mindset is different than a digital tool. A digital tool was, we used to advertise, and the paper now will advertise online. Uh, a digital tool is we used to do an email cam or a, a, a mail campaign, now we'll do an email campaign. A digital mindset for me is more like uh, if you know the, uh, uh, the app, uh, a Charity Alarm Clock, where every time you hit the snooze button on your alarm clock, it makes a charitable contribution to a nonprofit. A, a digital mindset recognizes that the way we live is out of sync with our old methods and seeks to exploit the way we live as the leverage point, not as a tool. The second thing I think groups are doing is they're reimagining their role and their mission. On the boards in Seattle is saying, we don't think of ourselves so much now as a place to present work. We think of our play, place as a community gathering point where community comes together to have difficult conversations with strangers and occasionally finds their way up to the performance. 
that's a fundamental different reconception of the role they're designed to play. I think the, the mission uh, question is really central. Uh, yesterday on the radio, Mark Zuckerberg uh, commented that the mission of Facebook was to connect the world. He didn't say the mission of Facebook was to operate Facebook. And what it suggests is that there's an openness to different ways of achieving what you think your mission is. Similarly, in the newspaper industry, um, you know, journalists, and one in particular, the former publisher of the Miami Herald, um, his view is that the, the mission is really around journalism and that you need for a democracy to function, you have to have high standards of journalism so you have an informed public that can allow people to execute their role as citizens really well. It's very different than saying our mission is to distribute a newspaper. And so one of the challenges, I think, in, in people who are running classical music organizations is to separate what is the mission from what is the strategy by which we achieve the mission. And I think we're at a moment where mission reconsideration is really critical. It's not enough to say we're in business to put on concerts. There has to be a larger mission, a larger purpose. And many, many organizations are doing as Mark Zuckerberg did. They say our purpose is to impact the world, make it a better place through music, to support, to engage, to contribute to the fabric of our community. So I think that the mission question is really paramount right now. We have a question over here, and I think we have an online question. Let's, let's go over here first, and yeah. then we'll... Hi. Um, I was just wondering, um, I feel that words carry a lot of weight, and uh, we live in a world where we have, uh, in all kinds of fields, we're seeing more pan, um, Things are, we're blurring the lines between a lot of things. So, it, for example, pansexualities and a lot of musicians are um, making hybrid music. Um, and I'm just wondering, for the term classical music, which is part of the title of today's symposium, what weight does that carry? And is it still relevant in today's society to be using a word that is so entrenched in a particular um, conception of music? and does it still make sense in conservatories to be using this term and when we're talking to a larger public? Who wants to take a... Marin? Well, I think that's a great question because actually the term classical music is incorrect anyway because classical music is actually a certain period in the history of art music. I, and so classical music is already a misnomer and then we only dig our hole deeper by calling it that. But what else would we call it? I'm not sure. Pan, pan music. But it's also true that historically there's much more connection between what we would consider to be popular mu music and art music than, we, than, we, than it became in, this, in the last hundred years. Oh, we could just sell the naming rights. <laughs> How about that? I mean, that would solve Google, all of Google the economic music. problems. Right? I like God. it. Yeah. Google music. No, I, I, yeah, I don't know, though. But I, I, classical music, it does sort of denote what, what we do, I suppose, now. But... Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I knew when, um, this is a while ago, but I knew when 7-Eleven started piping classical music into the parking lot to deter loitering. I knew that we were in trouble then, you know? <laughs> but I don't understand because it's, when I see the different mindset again in South America to classical music, you know, it, it's all about um, how early you're exposed to it and under what circumstances and what kind of vibe goes with it, too. I, this is, again, I don't know why we can't have fun. And that's an interesting question because, you know, we have a third of our students are from Asia, Peabody, and it is arguably, in, certainly in China, the proliferation of, of, um, of orchestras and, and presenting organizations is profound, it's explosive. Uh, you're talking about South America, so I guess the question is, what are we doing wrong here? if we are doing something wrong. Because a lot of the folks here, some, some won't work in the United States, but many will have their careers here. Well, I think who was, who was speaking to it was so uh, eloquent about that uh, the, it, 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 it's, it's become, uh, it, it isn't uh, just a vehicle anymore, it's become an institution unto itself to, and instead of, instead of serving the people, it has ended up serving, were you speaking of it? Yeah, um, Ben was. Uh, 
it, it ends up becoming its own prison in a way to, you know, so now we have to support this number of musicians and we have all these rules and all, you know, it, it got away from its essence, I think. Yeah. You know, there, there are two stories that, that, that I'll credit other people with, but actually the film brought it to mind because the difference for me between the Dudamel with the Simon Bolivar and the next clip, who I don't remember who the conductor was, you went instantly from brightly colored nylon jackets with a young group of people playing. And my favorite part of the Dudamel clips are usually when they do the Bernstein West Side Story clips, and in the middle of the performance, they jump, they, they jump up and they start dancing around. The next clip was guys in white tails, people being very formal. And, and I remember, the, uh, um, who was the guy that used to run St. Louis? Uh, Bruce Kopic was talking about when they did their first public referendum when he was at the St. Louis Symphony and the St. Louis Cardinals or, the, or you know, whoever the sports team was, was having a disastrous season and there were simultaneously a referendum to build a new sports stadium. Slatkin was conducting the St. Louis Orchestra. They were on a world-class tour. They had a Telarc contract. They were at the highest point of ascendancy. The sports team got their new stadium. The orchestra hall went down to resounding defeat. And when they asked people why, somebody said, you tell us when to show up, what to wear, when to applaud, you shame us if we applaud at the wrong time, and you tell us what's good for us and you expect us to like you. And, and combined with that story, uh, uh, Eric, uh, uh, who does the, the, with the kid, Eric, uh, uh, Eric Booth, talks about traditionally for most of us, there was the day in third grade where you, they gave away, we used to have called flutophones. I don't know if flutophones mean anything to anybody anymore. But when they used to pass them out, they'd sit on the desk and you, the teacher would come in and basically say, don't touch them, don't touch them. Don't try to put that down, put that down, put that down. And they'd say, put your finger here. Now put, now put your finger here. Now, by the time the first session was over, it was torture and penalizing. Versus what Eric does, which is basically, he says, pick them up, make a sound. Now do it. And some kids bang them on the desk or whatever. Make another sound. Do, make another sound. You just wrote a song. And suddenly the kids are animated. I think there's so many cultural differences, but our experience of classical music here is often medical. We're being told it's good for us and suffer through it. And to the point about the language, I think what we know in many musical forms is the labels are active disincentives for people. We, we in the jazz field, we actually work with Chamber Music America who basically said we've decided chamber music is a live musical form involving no more than 11 musicians with no parts double. Why isn't that jazz? Why is that just Schubert? That is jazz, as well as Schubert, and they opened that up in a different way. If we called this instead of classical music, let's just call it big kick-ass music. And for a different, or, or something that emphasizes the scale, the power, but when you say classical, for an audience who's had a negative experience, it's a disincentive that will not be overcome easily. Ben, I have to say, having just come from the St. Louis Symphony where I spent the last six and a half years, that would never happen now. Yeah. So, <laughs> so there is progress. That's, it. That's my point, there is progress. Um, we have time for one question before we're gonna take a short break and come back to talk about the question that I think is on everybody's mind, which is how does this impact us here? How does this impact how we get everybody in this room ready for careers? What changes do we need to make? Should we make changes based on what's happening in our field? But before we do that, Leslie, one question from the, uh, from the internet folks. Yes, I'm here representing all those participating via Ustream and other ways. We have a really lively conversation happening right now. Tons of questions pouring in. One that I'm going to share comes to us from Twitter, actually. And we've talked a lot about the different kinds of change happening. And someone asks, how can you get the word out to the media that there is change and to audiences? How do we get the word out to the media and to audiences? With all due respect, I think it's the wrong question. I mean, and, and all I mean by that is the media, as we've known it, like music critics and newspaper, are a dying form. Word of mouth and exponential, the ability to post something and, and for it to go viral, the real question is how do you create things that make it easy for people to love you and share that love with other people? The media is not going to cover the arts if we bomb, bomb Iraq tomorrow. Nothing you can do. You can have the best arts initiative. It's not going to cover. We can't control the media. In this internet age, what we can put out there is it's a new infinite horizon in a different way. And so for me, the question isn't how can we get the, to the media. The question is how can we articulate in a media age the power, the love, the affection of what we do and then make that available to other people to share. 
I would take a slightly different approach to the question. I mean, I think the question is valid because in reality, in order to get somebody, uh, in order to get a member of the public to commit to something these days, when you're competing with so many, so, such a wide variety of different content available, so many different channels and so affordable or sometimes free, um, how do you compete with that? You, you, it's, no, it's not enough just to have the blogosphere. It's not enough to just have USA Today. You have to sort of ambush the audience. And very often, somebody you need three or four impressions before somebody is actually going to dip their hand in their pocket and, and buy a, a ticket to the symphony or something like that. So I think the conventional media may be dying, but it is, it is very important um, still. Having said that, I think that this, this question of, well, maybe we should rename it, it shouldn't be classical music after all, it, that's okay. I mean, it's not really, it do, this is not a branding crisis in and of itself, because I can imagine a, a USA head, Today headline, you know, five years from now saying, classical music is hot. I can see that happening, and people starting to think, hmm, I have to check out what's going on. What kind of thing could bring about that kind of a change in the temperature of the way classical music is perceived in, in the world? In reality, I think it's about youth and energy. You know, the, the, the kind of energy you're talking about in South America, which is a different landscape altogether, the kind that you feel the moment you walk in the room there, so different from here. We need that to be happening in America and in, in, um, in Europe as well. Um, and the way that that's going to come about is is through that youthful energy uh because you know having been in rock and roll for a number of years i know that that you know there is a certain age and a certain energy level that exists with youth that starts to dissipate and become more entrenched and stayed and you know becomes more about the tailcoats and so on as as people get older so we're not worried about those people they're going away soon anyway right it's these people that we care <laughs> wow. about it's these people so. we really care about and it's those people we need to get engaged uh, and and i think the media interest will follow on and i think it's going to then um reverberate around the 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 blogosphere and the the social media world as well and, and just quickly i think the real question is who follows whom and, and for me, more and more, the media follows the blogosphere rather than the media leads it. And the three words that I would draw to your attention that to me make this absolutely crystal clear are Ice Bucket Challenge. Yeah. Ice Bucket Challenge, which raised $43 million, 750,000 new donors, which no newspaper or media source told you about until it was a phenomenon, and they were the latest to wake up and see it, and then they started printing it in the papers. I think increasingly, especially for a younger generation, the media doesn't lead, the media follows. And in virtually every survey of research done in the arts, the word art is a disincentive. The art, and I think the only way that we will get to the classical music as a hot thing is if we learn to reframe it in the short term, because again, I think the media follows increasingly, the media does not lead. But that's just, that may be a difference in perspective and opinion. And I think at this point, we're going to take a brief break. We're going to say about 10 minutes. Come back. We have a lot of important conversation to go. This part of the conversation, a couple, couple of things I would just, I would mention. This is, I guess, in the next couple of questions is where we get a little bit closer to what we all do here. We've been talking generally about a little bit more about the climate out there. We'll continue to talk about that, but I think one of the things I want to bring the conversation around to in this next, in this next round is, is, is how this changing environment uh, actually might inform, should inform, must inform um, how we train musicians for the future going forward. Um, and I think that that's, you know, without getting overly specific, I think that's one of the things we want to begin to explore here and explore with all of you. And the other thing I'm going to ask of our panelists is, is if, we can, if we can keep this between us and the audience as interactive as possible um, and be as thoughtful as you're being and as crisp as you can be also. And so that we can, because I want to make sure we get to a few more questions. We also have a lot of in internet questions. I think we've got about 250 questions online that have come in and we've got about 300 people actually that are that are viewing this live online so with that let me let me throw that out to the group um, who wants to who wants to begin by talking about you know how you how you think what you see and what we've been talking about uh, up to now should inform how we think about you know training people and I would just you know as a, as a premise I would offer up the following that I think 
conservatories are generally pretty conservative, not surprisingly, about how we train people and how we go at that. And um, I think, the, you know, the question is, is, is what kind of evolution is, is needed and required? I'm happy to answer anything about education. Please, <laughs> jump in. I think, first of all, uh, if this is a performing institution, what we have to do, first of all, is to make a lot of performing opportunities for everybody. Everybody who studies here should be performing all the time. Um, because there's nothing like the experience and the experience of failure as well to know how to start to change. Um, I think we... Performing up on stage, performing out in the community. Everywhere. Perform well, but that's, that, yeah, that's a part uh -huh. of it. I think, I think, first of all, venues all over Baltimore should be used. I just uh, met somebody who runs an Airbnb, and I was thinking of staying there, and I saw that he had a great lobby in his building, and I said, what about concerts here? And he said, yep, so all my students, you're playing at the lobby on, I don't know where it is, Park Avenue. Uh, it's just one more place to play. Uh, and that's something that we have to keep doing. I think having a lot of com uh, contemporary music is also very important, having opportunities to do interactive things between the departments, which we do a lot of, uh, both early music and contemporary music and other departments. Um, we have, and almost every school now in the United States and in Germany, by the way, uh, has a whole uh, department that's devoted to uh, career management, to music management, to uh, entrepreneurship. They teach people how to, to, to write grants, how to apply for grants, how to do community outreach. And I think at Peabody there have been a lot of examples of that in the past. Creative access was something that was here, started here. So it's empowering also the, the kids to do things themselves. But to uh, support, I think, just actually the performance wherever it is, in whatever platform it is, is a huge part of how we can help because the experience is everything. Other comments? I want to just address the, the outreach piece of that. Yeah. Um, when I started out in the music business 35 years ago, uh, if you were lucky enough to get signed by a record company, then the record company did the promotion, did the marketing, and so on. Uh, musicians these days in bands need to be their own self-promoters. You have to be great at marketing yourself. You have to engage with your fan base, however small, and, and try and turn it into a bigger fan base. And you do that by letting your guard down, showing your vulnerability, sharing with them the, the problem you're having with writer's block with the lyrics for your new song, or the fact that you, you practice this, this piece of Prokofiev over and over again and you still can't nail it. I mean, the, I think the audience loves being involved in those kinds of things and we have the ability now with social media to do that. Um, and so I think another piece of the responsibility for a conservatory like this, I know the word conservative is part of the word conservatory, uh, but to move with the times we have to encourage that uh, along with the performance piece. We have to uh, make sure that the students understand that each one of you is an entrepreneur now. Um, it's not like the old days when an orchestral musician would show up and read the paper until you know, they punch the clock and then they pull out their instruments and do their bit and go home and leave the office behind them. Every musician needs to be part of that community, part of that collective, and needs to make, uh, make a strong effort to outreach to the community. Uh, Maren, what do you think? Because you, you hire professional musicians. In I do orchestra. think, though, that the, this idea of um, experiential learning so that you you have the whole um, the whole range of what goes into uh, into creating a concert. I, I think probably for me the best uh, the best experience was really just you know out of out of desperation when I made my own orchestra because nobody would let me conduct. So, um, but by making my own orchestra, I had to figure out a lot of things. I mean, how. It was in New York City, you know, where there was a lot of orchestras. So how do you, how do you create something that's compelling in an atmosphere that's already saturated with offerings? How do you, how do you hire the musicians? How do, you, what kind of? I developed my own audition process because I don't think audition, the audition process for today's orchestras is um, effective. So um, you know, and and how do you market something like that, and how do you create a board of directors? So it was out of desperation that I learned all these skills. I, I certainly never, I, I never had a single um, discussion about this in my I, uh, my years at Juilliard. I was at Juilliard pre college from the time I was seven. I, I never had one discussion about anything like this. You know, I actually never even had a discussion about playing in an orchestra. It was all just concerto-based. I'm sure that's changed to a certain degree, but certainly not nowhere near to the degree that it needs to change. So I think having 
having these experience in project-based things where you have to develop a program, figure out who your audience is going to be, find your audience, find out how you're going to fund it, be creative. But, you know, it's not taking away from your practice time. It's, it's, um, it's expo exponentially increasing your creativity. Do you think the audition process for orchestras is going to change? I, I, maybe not in my lifetime, but it certainly should. But, you know, when I say this, the next thing I know is, you know, I'm in the New York Times and, you know, quoted as some kind of anarchist, you know, by saying this. <laughs> but I don't know anybody that thinks this is an effective process where you play, somebody plays notes behind a screen for 10 minutes and then, uh, you know, is selected and given a job for life. I mean, seriously? How, how should it work? Sorry? How should it be? Well, first of all, there's a, there's a hum, human quality to playing in an orchestra that really needs to be tested and understood. And also, I believe that every member of a large team has to exhibit a certain um, commitment to being a citizen of the world and a certainly as minimally a citizen of that team. And what do you bring to the table besides being able to play the notes in the right place? Sorry, I think there's more you have to bring to it for me. So, um, I, I don't know. I guess, so the question that I want to ask is, or that I would ask the group is, I mean, we don't train physicians the same way we trained them 100 years ago. I mean, there's, you, you learn anatomy, and I, I'm not, you know, I would imagine you do, I hope you do. But, 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 you're, but you're learning, it's, 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 a different, it's a different field than it was 100 years ago. So I guess my question is, is I, would, I would make the argument that we still train musicians the same way we did it But I would, years ago. I would even take that further. I would say, actually, there is a, there is a direct parallel because in medicine now is a extreme specialization. And I think that's where we've come to in music as well. It's an extreme specialization so that if you play the violin, you have to play the violin at this certain level with this range of error you know, which is the bandwidth gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and all of those kinds of things in order to get a job. But, you know, to sustain a job, it's not, that is not required. I mean, that's another whole discussion point. But I, I, think, I think you're right that the way we train musicians is, mm, it's not in the real world. And so it perpetuates this, this a antiquity that we have. Can I say something? Uh, I, I'm, for, I'm afraid a little bit the black sheep in here because I think the violin that was played uh, 300 years ago and the violin that's played nowadays is not vastly different. And our human beings, we are also still the same. And playing an instrument, though, and this is something that my students must be cringing because it does require a lot of dedication of doing it. And you don't have to necessarily change the way you, you learn the instrument. The other things around the music business that we do and, and being accessible, finding ways of, of, of creating opportunities for yourself, but just the mastering of the instrument, I don't think that it's necessary for us to be trying to be creative or to replace those kinds of things with other things. You cannot substitute the quality and the, the amount of practice that you have to have. You cannot substitute it. There's no shortcut. You have to spend a lot of time working. And, and, and in that respect, I find, that's what I said at the beginning, that sometimes I think we're losing our fluidity and our skill with the language itself. We're removing ourselves from the language to the point uh, that we are thinking about the outside aspects of it and not the internal part. So how many people here know how to do figured bass? Why do we not know harmony? Why do we not know theory? Why don't we not know form or style? Let's talk about style. We should be musicians who know the distinction between French Baroque and German Baroque. And, and I think we're actually losing that kind of thing in trying to be too successful and too adaptable to what's the, in the 21st century. I'm not trying to negate those things, but uh, I think that we cannot lose the substance and the connection for what we have. Do, do you honestly think that we, the reason we're losing those fundamentals is because we're trying to adapt to the 21st century? I think sometimes they're being substituted. We are talking about sometimes teaching people how to become educators. Speaking of Bernstein, who touched everybody, he was the most amazing communicator I have ever, ever met, and I only met him for the time he came to Juilliard to conduct us in the orchestra. Um, and the impact he made on us was incredible. I think he made an impact on so many young people through his lectures. 
And the reason he was such an incredible communicator was not because he was taught how to take a communication course, it was because he really knew what he was talking about. And that to me is what is the essential thing that as a conservatory I feel we should, we should not lose. I'm not saying we cannot add other things, but I don't want us to lose that. And I see trends sometimes where we are pushing our students to do so many different things and to be successful in those that we are sometimes, yes, losing the respect for having uh, the discipline and developing the discipline on our instruments. Jesse, is it enough? Uh, Tom Friedman last year did two interviews in the New York Times with the guy who's in charge of hiring at Google. And uh, the most striking thing about this was the guy at Google said that technical expertise was not part of the criteria for, sec for selecting Google employees. They took that as a given. What they were really interested in were people who showed leadership qualities. And they defined them. You know, we can all, all define them in different ways. But a couple of things they said were people who had attention to what was going on in the outside world, people who could function successfully in groups, people who knew when to step up when their own leadership had to uh, come to the fore, and people who knew, knew when to recede and let others take the reins. And um, I went to the Manhattan School of Music in Juilliard, and um, I hope, I, I think things are different now than when I was there, but those were both really good trade schools, and um, they trained you for a very deep and narrow set of skills that could be serviceable in maybe three or four types of work. And it was all extremely uh, well-defined. And I think today, simply as a practical matter, if that's all you come out of school with, your ability to uh, realize your creative potential and to secure employment is gonna be really limited because the context in which we're educating people is way, way different than it was back then. I mean, there were never enough jobs, but, um, you know, now the nature of work as a musician is really, it's up for grabs and everyone can play a role in defining it. So one of the elements I think is really crucial around conservatory experience has to do with the culture of a school. And when I was at uh, Manhattan School of Music, we'd organized a trombone players group and uh, the purpose of the group was to play for one another and offer each other feedback. And um, nobody really wanted to do this initially. Everyone was very apprehensive because, you know, after all, giving feedback was not something anyone was used to doing. But we did it, and it worked really well. People gave terrific feedback. They were sensitive. They didn't pull punches. And out of this, the trombone players uh, got really close and formed the first student government at the Manhattan School of Music. So we went to see uh, the president of the school on behalf of the government because um, at that time, Manhattan was graduating students who after four years never played in a symphony orchestra. They over-enrolled like crazy because they needed the admission income. So we brought our concerns to the president who said, well, this is just preparation for the outside world because after all, you're gonna be competing against each other, so you might as well start competing against each other here. Well, that's a value and that's a, an expression and in fact was a reality of the culture in the school. And I think that to the extent that we have a view that conservatory students can play larger roles in shaping their own destinies as artists, that really needs to begin in, in school, in the kinds of responsibilities students have, the roles they play in their own learning, the roles they play in ensembles, as, as Marin said, having a, a more 360 kind of engagement with what it means to produce events, to organize uh, performances. The woman who heads uh, ICE, the International Contemporary Ensemble, Claire Chase, um, is of the belief that everyone in ICE, in addition to performing, has to play administrative roles. So there's development directors, there's a bassoon player, there are operations directors, a clarinetist, and so on and so forth. Um, so I think there's a, uh, an opportunity in conservatories to really not only add programs that provide for outreach and community engagement and things like that, but the very nature of what the school feels like, what it believes in, what, what, what is the culture of the institution, I think is a place for, for important change. I'd like to um, open it up if we can to get a question in here. Um, yes. Hi. Um, I, uh, one of my favorite quotes that has kind of uh, driven my personal development as a musician is, 
that if you um, want to help people, you should be a lawyer or a doctor. Um, but if you want to change the world, you should be an artist. Um, I think that speaks a lot to our, our need in society and, and our need not only as a form of entertainment, but also as um, a public service. Um, I think sometimes the general community, I, at least the people that I've talked to, sometimes see classical musicians as irrelevant to their personal lives. And I'm wondering if um, we fostered a curriculum at a conservatory um, and through our general music education that is focused on the community and uh, making connections with them and giving other people a voice if that is a, um, if that would be an effective use of our time and your thoughts on that. So that's a great question and Ben and then I'd like to hear what other people, I'm sure other people have thoughts on that here as well. You know there's, there's an, a, a big discussion right now about the difference between what's being called social practice and civic practice in the arts. Social practice is defined as the artist determines the agenda and then see, it says basically, I've decided I want to play Beethoven, how do I get an audience to come to see it? Civic practice is an artist goes into a community and says, this is what I can do. What do you as a community need that I can help you with and you tell me how to make use of these gifts? I think into the, the training question, depending on what kind of artist you want to be, will be at the root of that question. If you want to be a social practice artist, the conservatory training you allude to, complemented by business skills, is probably as much as you need to go. If you want to be a social or a civic practice artist, you need, I think, a base digital literacy, and you need intercultural fluency, especially in a diverse world, and you need to be actively engaged in volunteerism and civic practice in a different way. Both that training and that ambition really, I think, beg the question of what do you see your role in the world as being, and what kind of musician do you want to be? And I hope you hear, as I say this, again in the spectrum, I'm perfectly supportive of either decision you'd make and think there's value in both. You know, I, and I genuinely and honestly say that. But I think it asks that question, and it asks the question in structuring curriculum, which kind of artist do we want to produce? And the ultimate tricky question in the curriculum is, these things aren't additive. If you're serious about making a civic practice artist versus a social, it's not five more courses to add. The real question is, what are you gonna give up out of the current curriculum to make time and space to pursue these new skills of civic participation, intercultural fluency, and digital literacy that you're gonna need to survive? What a great point, because I think one of the challenges that we all face here, and, that, and I've certainly had this conversation with faculty and with students, is that, is that we, there's a lot of things that are going on in terms of, I think, students, um, uh, things that they want to do in terms of the community. We have the uh, community access program was mentioned, which is a fantastic student-driven program here. The question is, is that I would argue that um, we, what we do with this here right now and probably in every other conservatory is peripheral in terms of this kind of what you're talking about. It's peripheral. It's there if you want it. My question is, is that good enough? Is that good enough? Because I think that when you, when, based on the world that we've been talking about, is that good enough? I think it's fantastic that you uh, bring up the question and I think um, it's a great generation now that is thinking about what kind of citizens of the world you want to be and uh, I have to say that um, really it's, uh, I think it, it's after the model of my teacher, Leonard Bernstein, who was an incredible citizen of the world and uh, setting that kind of example to stand up for what he believed in, even, even at the expense of loss, um, that is the example that we should emulate. That's my belief anyway. And I, but I certainly know that that's not the way an older generation of professional musicians looked at themselves because when I came to the Baltimore Symphony and um, maybe it's a good, do you want to go into the well, clip soon or you want to, the, but talking to the musicians of the Baltimore Symphony when I first got there and challenged them and I was standing on the podium and just talking to them and I said, well, you know, what, what kind of citizens of the world do you want to be? And really, I was clear that this was not a question that they had ever entertained, or maybe a few of them, but certainly not, and never as a group. You know, where do we want, what, what do we aspire to do 
here in Baltimore? What do we aspire to do as part of our community? So that it's, and it's a slow process of change, so it's extremely inspiring to me to hear um, this generation, and, and it, you really can change the world, I believe. Can I ask you, Fred, um, what are your um, lofty goals as far as uh, the civic service of Peabody within the city of Baltimore and beyond? Well, I, I guess I see, if, you know, in terms of, in terms of the, the civic portion of this, I see two components to it. One is that I think, and this gets into our next question, I think there is a, I call it moral obligation for any major cultural institution to be of and part of the community. I think that's a moral obligation because I think we have assets, we have, we have a breadth of talent that should be shared. And that partly does happen here through, through our prep, which is fantastic, or through you know, certain things that go on the conservatory. But I, I still, I, I would argue there's still a disconnect. And so I, I would challenge our, our organization to say, how do we become more part of the community? I also think it's, it's enlightened self-interest because I think ultimately we are in the audience development business. Um, we are all in the audience development business. And I'm not sure that conservatories or schools of music have traditionally thought of themselves in that way. And, and then I would bring it back internally and say, if we're going to, this is a great opportunity because that exists to turn that inward and use that platform, that landscape out there as a way of training and teaching uh, all of these folks are going to go and be part of that world, how to be successful in it, or how to be more successful in it, uh, and how to navigate it. And I think, so I guess, you know, it is, it is, and again, I don't, I don't see this as, and this is, I think, and I, Ben, you had hit on it earlier, and I think this is where the rub becomes a lot of the time, that people think it's either or. And in reality, I don't, I, I've, I don't believe it's that way in an orchestra. I don't believe it's that way in an institution like this. I think ultimately you have to figure out how to do both successfully. And I think that, um, so that's, you know, to answer your question, what I would, what I would challenge the institution to. Can I just share in that regard, the, the single most inspiring speech I heard anybody give in the last year was a guy named Scott Cohen, who was president of Tulane University who basically said, we came back from Katrina and New Orleans was destroyed. And our mission was to be a home of scholarly learning, blah, blah, blah. And we could say, okay, well, we're available as an intellectual resource, but nothing in that mission made us say, we're gonna roll up our sleeves and rebuild the city. And he said, so I chose to ignore the mission of the university, which I thought, wow, I've never heard a college president say this. And he said, so I mandated that every course and every, every course and for every student had to have a public service component. And what that meant was, he said, the first people on my doorstep were the philosophy students, the philosophy majors saying, what the hell are we gonna do for public service? <laughs> and one of the goals, he said, Tulane's gonna rebuild New Orleans in one of four ways, and one of them is we're gonna rebuild K to 12 education. And the philosophy students realized we knew how to develop ideas, and so philosophy majors were coaching debate teams in every high school in New Orleans. And by reimagining that role and by saying it's not enough to say we're passively here and we're a resource, but saying we're going to roll up our sleeves and get dirty and remake this place, they reimagined that university. Attendance was up, enrollment was up, grades were I mean, it, it, he said that's not why we did it, but it's transformed the entire university as a whole. I, I just find that one of the more incredible stories that if we're interested in doing this, the question is, how do we share what we know? And it's not necessarily playing concerts. We actually support a program right now at the University of Michigan where musicians are teaching medical students how to listen. Because often doctors don't know how to listen to their patients. And by working with musicians, doctors are becoming better doctors because they're understanding how to listen in new ways. We're seeing at the Memphis Symphony, chamber musicians are teaching corporate leaders at UPS what consensual team development means. Because as used to, as opposed to a top-down thing, a chamber quartet who has no conductor has to have a team dynamic that executives are learning that. It's just a whole different range of possibilities if we're really serious about rebuilding the world around us. Um, take another question. 
something online. I have another one that comes to us from online. Do you think that the concert hall will still be the center for classical music making 25 years from now, and is it currently? Great question. Um, I'm sorry, I just, I think, uh, as my experience has been this week and uh, in the next few weeks I'm touring again, um, I'm seeing that a lot of the places that I'm playing are no longer just the concert halls. I think the concert halls are still there. There's some beautiful halls and why should we not use them? Um, uh, but I think that the experience is changing a little bit, even, for instance, the format that we're here. We're here on a stage. It's not that formal. If you were all here with us, it would be a different situation. So you can just put it in this room to imagine. And I do think that um, there are a lot of different venues coming out. Uh, and I, I, I don't think it will only be the concert halls. There was a study, that, oh, I'm sorry, I was just saying there was a study a few years ago that, that revealed the number one venue for classical music in the United States is the automobile. <laughs> that through car radio, more people experience classical music through car radio and CDs in the automobile than they do already in concert halls. I've played concerts at the Volkswagen uh, factory in Germany, yeah. so. <laughs> Jesse? Um, I got a tour a few years ago when the uh, new hall in Miami opened for the New World Symphony, and uh, Howard Herring, the guy who runs the hall, gave the tour. And one of the most amazing things was that throughout the entire tour, he never once mentioned the word acoustics. And uh, people who are involved in concert hall design are typically preoccupied with creating the most perfect acoustical environment. And in Miami, it wasn't that that wasn't important to them, but it was only one of a whole set of other goals they had. And if you look at this building, it's fascinating because it's, it's a Frank Gehry design building, but the, all the wavy stuff is on the inside. And on the outside, it's, a, it's a, basically a rectangular plane. And if you look at it straight on, what you see on the left side of the facade of the building is all glass and you can see inside the building, you can see inside into practice rooms and administrative offices. And on the other side of the facade is a wall, which is where they do their wall casts. So the old idea of a concert hall was to protect you and shelter you from the outside in order to create this perfect acoustical environment. The idea in the New World Symphony Hall is that it's a porous idea. In other words, it plays the, the walls actually serve to project outward what's happening on inside and to let people on the outside see what's going on on the inside. So I think it's wonderful that new halls are developing with a whole different program, a whole different concept of what is the purpose of a hall and how does what goes on inside relate to people on the outside. Um, so I think there's a great, just great opportunity in this. And then the fact that so many wonderful performances are now happening in smaller venues, I think, is a great, great development. I mean, clearly, a significant part of today's audience wants to be closer to the experience. And there's something about a 1800, 2800-seat concert hall that, as we traditionally designed them, it imposes a kind of formality. And it's not that that's wrong or bad, but it just kind of goes with the territory. So I would hope you know we'd envision a mix of types of venues. So I think what we're going to do, because I'm going to make an executive decision here, we're going to, we had another break scheduled. We're not going to do that because we're a little bit behind and we had a longer break the, initially. But I'm going to ask everybody, well, let's take two minutes, stand up, stretch your legs, and then we're going to go into the next segment, but don't leave. So before we get into the, the final segment, actually, uh, we have, uh, I've, I'm going to ask Marin to tee up um, a video that's, uh, well, it's really impressive, actually, and, I, and I'm, I'm on, the, on the ORCIDS program, which has been such a fabulous program, and um, take it away. So this is, um, uh, one of the things we haven't talked about really is, uh, particularly in uh, classical music, is the lack of diversity. And uh, when I came to the Baltimore Symphony, you know, I did notice that um, in a city that's 85% African American, there was one African American musician in my orchestra. And, uh, you know, thinking about that, why is this the case? And, and I think a lot of it has to do with the economics of it, that minority kids don't have access to um, instruments and private lessons and don't have these resources. And uh, anyway, uh, out of that, um, rose a, uh, a desire um, on my part to try to uh, affect some kind of change, maybe not in my lifetime, but certainly in, in a few generations from now. 
And uh, so we started a program, uh, we, called it, we call it ORCIDS, Orchestra Kids. And it's an after school program in West Baltimore. And uh, this video is uh, quite old now. Um, and a lot of the kids here are much taller than I am now. But we started with uh, 30 kids uh, in 2007, and we have 750 kids now. And 15 of the kids attend um, Peabody Preparatory, which is pretty cool. So this is a little video about ORCIDS. Hardly any place needs that change more than West Baltimore, where poverty, drugs, and shootings are endemic, where since last fall, young children carrying musical instruments to school has been a common sight. Saxophone? Mm -hmm. All right. About 150 pre-K to third graders at Lockerman Bundy Elementary School belong to a new privately funded music program started by Marin Alsop, the conductor of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. Called Orchestra Kids, or ORCIDS for short, it's another example of the system taking root in America. It's all about exposure at a very, very young age. There's so many skill sets that you need. Coordination, you have to develop your ear, you have to develop your brain. And just like learning a foreign language, the younger you start, the more fluent you become. And that's what you're trying to do with ORCIDS. You know, it's sort of a work in progress. Work really kicked off last October when a truck pulled up at the school carrying $50,000 worth of musical instruments. Enough for an orchestra, and enough to make these kids think it was Christmas. I got a big one. You got a big one, what's the... Parents are parents. When you offer someone's child an opportunity to better themselves, I mean, People all the jump at it, huh? They jump at it. So you want to show your dad what you can do? Let's come on in here. We saw an example of that when Alsop and Dan Trahey, who runs Orchids, ran into tuba player Miguel Ware. He He's five. All right. All we need from you guys is a commitment that, that he'll be here. Parents have to sign a contract promising that kids like Miguel will be there, get good grades, and take care of their instruments. When the regular school day ends at 3.15, the kids start making music. Start making music. If they stick with the program, They'll be doing it all the way from kindergarten to the fifth grade. The staff of about 15 teachers, some of the musicians from the Baltimore Symphony, work with the kids. Deshane Parker, a single mother with three children in the program, says they love it. They want to come to school every day. They don't want to miss a day from the program. And now that they're bringing their instruments home, it's just teaching them how to be you know, better children and responsible. And you play the cello. We saw that yesterday. Cello. cello. Yes, cello. <laughs> what is it about the cello that you like? That you can play like different sounds on different strings, and you can like make it sound different. And you can play open notes and harmonics. You know a lot about music, don't you? Yes. And the kids in Baltimore are already picking up the baton, a baton which could one day take them someplace like this. So that's really fantastic. Um, and, and it's at, yeah, that's worth a round of applause. Amazing. It's, it's an amazing program. And, and, and that's four years ago now. I mean, and these kids are now, it, it's amazing though how long it takes really to, I mean, uh, to your point, you know, it takes so long to really, and so much dedication, so many hours to really become professional. I mean, ju not just proficient, but uh, excellent on your instrument. So, I, I mean, you realize that when you start working with, with little kids. But the one thing I do want to say is Dan Trahey, who's the artistic director, is a Peabody graduate, and he teaches here as well. And many Peabody students and um, graduates uh, have joined us in teaching these kids and are a tremendous asset. And as we move to the future, Fred and I are hoping to really expand this um, opportunity 
to, to all the students here to participate in some way because, you know, I mean, it seems like we're bringing a lot to them, but the reality is it, it, it's really a two-way street. So the, this is an interesting, this gets into the, the third question, which is, which is, I thought this would be a great segue to that because it is, you know, here is an example of where orchestras, specifically the Baltimore Symphony, is really redefining their relationship with the community. And, and um, I, I guess my, the question that I would ask then in terms of institutions like Peabody, and I think Peabody is, is unique in ways because of where we are in this city and what the, what the, what the possibilities are, that um, you know, what do we see as our role? in terms of the community? I mean, do, you know, how, how do we see that role and, and how, do we, how do you make that operational? What do we see philosophically? And, and, um, and what do we do to change what we're doing, if anything, in order to reflect that? One thing that occurs to me, and it's not a specific thing to do, but it's a kind of a mindset shift. And um, I, I'm recalling a conversation I had with the orchestra committee of the Louisiana Philharmonic, and this was um, three weeks before they were about to move uh, back into their regular concert hall after Katrina uh, it was underwater. And so for four years, they performed in churches and community centers around, uh, around New Orleans. And I asked them uh, how they felt about uh, moving back to their hall, and. I said, you must really be looking forward to it. And they said, well, no. You know, as a matter of fact, we've really enjoyed playing in these, uh, in these venues. And I said, oh, come on, you know, uh, the acoustics must have been terrible. I'm sure, you know, you were uncomfortable, couldn't see, et cetera, et cetera. And they said, well, you know, as a matter of fact, we became a better orchestra. Our playing improved because we were playing in these venues. And what they said was that when they were in venues where they couldn't see each other, they listened better. And when they couldn't hear each other, they watched each other more closely. And then they said the, the biggest reason why they felt they improved as an ensemble was that in these venues, they could see the impact of their music making on the audiences. And that, in turn, came back to them and inspired them to play even better. And I, I mention this because for a long time and still you know we continue to think of these two worlds you know there's one where we make a choice and we're going to be about excellence and playing really well or there's another choice it's about uh playing a more active role and being more engaged with our communities and somehow these live on two two sides of a of a, of a spectrum and this instance in new orleans was so fascinating as an expression of how um, expanding the roles that artists play and increased contact, not less contact, with their publics is actually part of the ingredients that goes into performing really, really well and achieving excellence. So I think there's kind of a, you know, a, a, a different way of thinking about this than we've thought about it in the past. Um, one of the things that actually always excited me about teaching here at Peabody uh, was that you could be in one institution under a roof with so much talent. And I mean talent from the faculty uh, to the students, uh, th from both generations. So you, there's a pool of a resource that's pretty amazing. And I think one of the things even more exciting about Peabody is that it belongs to a greater institution, Johns Hopkins, where the talent is, is not limited to just music. It's actually in astrophysics, it's in, in literature, in art, in medicine, obviously. Um, and so I think that the, the possibilities of crea creating things within this institution are sort of limitless. Um, I don't know exactly what the institution, what the responsibility of the institution is. I can't speak for uh, others as much as I can for myself. My direct responsibility is to teach my students uh, music and flute in particular. Um, but I think that also we have to be role models ourselves. The students like to emulate, hopefully to aspire to the things that their teachers do. And I think that if we as faculty are also very engaged in the community, it makes a great impact. And um, I wanted to mention one thing. I have friends in, in Boston and Rochester who started some years ago already um, a foundation called Music for Food. 
And this is really starting to take off more and more, and it's an incredible thing because it's a charity organization for the community, but it involves them as performing musicians who play chamber music with each other and with the students. And in so doing, they bring it to the community and they raise funds for, this is in this particular case, Music for Food is about uh, food for, for people who are in need in the community. So I think that having this sort of a, a platform on, in a way and being able to expand to other uh, disciplines throughout the community, I think there are a lot of things that we can do that are both educational for our own students who come here to study. After all, this is what they pay money for is to study and develop themselves. But if they also see that at the same time you can give back to the community in a way that is also beneficial to them, it can start creating a lot of wonderful uh, opportunities. Other, other thoughts on that? I think, I, I think it is, you know, that, and, and you hit on it, the key, the key point is that it is a two-way street. Because I think that the, the, when we think about it that way, that it's not just about doing good things in the community, that's certainly part of it. And I, and I think your point also about the broader Johns Hopkins, that's certainly included in that. That's, you know, that's part of, part of our community. But it's about what, what comes back to the students in terms of, or the faculty, what comes back to us, you know, in terms of what we get out of it, artistically or as, you know, in terms of, in terms of um, fulfillment and in terms of enhancing the skills, our own skills uh, in these situations. So I think that's the, that's the to me, is, I think, of it, think of it as a two-way street. Part of the big success of the um, South American program, El Sistema, is the concept of mentoring. And so um, once a child has um, studied an instrument for two weeks, um, he or she is then required to teach another student what he or she knows. And I think that's something that we've lost a lot um, through, uh, and just through many different things, but not the least of which is uh, being so highly competitive in our fields sometimes. I think it, it doesn't lend itself to nurturing each other and, and being mentors and, and that kind of um, cycle. So I think it is important as teachers to be uh, role models, but also as students to mentor each other. And it's amazing what a very small amount of um, effort can, can reap. And you can really change somebody's life. It doesn't require hours and hours of time. It just requires a little bit of care. Great comment. Um, questions. Do we have other questions that have come in? Or that we have questions that people want to ask in terms of that are in the audience? We've got a couple up here. Let's start over here. Thank you. Melissa Lander here. I'm a clarinetist. Um, I would like to revisit that idea of curriculum and curriculum changes a little bit more. Um, I'm probably take the cake as the oldest student here at Peabody at 41 um, doing a graduate performance diploma with Anthony McGill and my focus at this stage in my life is much different than when I was 20 and many um, things that I could have taken back then would have helped me do what I want to do now. Um, the business of music class is absolutely fantastic, and I think it should be required for undergraduates. Um, conducting, I went to Eastman, I went to University of Michigan and Northwestern, lots of degrees here. Um, none of them ever required me to do conducting. Um, I think there are lots of these types of courses that even as a performance major, I should have been required to take and would help students do what they could really maybe not foresee that they might want to do in the future. So if we could revisit that a little bit, what curriculum changes could be seen and, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that is, that it's a great question and I think, and it is interesting how your perspective changes, doesn't it, when, you're, when you've been out there. Um, I, I think this is, you know, this is part of, this is one of the essential questions I think that we face as we go forward and that's when I was saying earlier that we do some of these things some people here do a lot of these things, but it all sort of exists on the periphery of the institution. It's not really central. It's not been brought into, um, integrated into the, into the curriculum in the way that some people argue, myself included, that it needs to be and what that looks like. And, and I think there are ways to do it. I think there are ways to do it and, and serve the purposes of the applied study as well. I mean, I, 
and I think there are a number of ideas that are percolating about that, but I think that that becomes the central question, I think, for us, is how do you, you know, it, it does become a curriculum question, ultimately, in terms of how do we, how does this need to evolve so that we can accomplish both objectives? But you should definitely be on the task force yep. or, or some sort of discussion committee to to look at what what you think is super effective and, and influential. So make sure you grab her. Yeah. Back here, this question. Thank you. I was wondering, as new music and contemporary music is usually supported and encouraged the most in the music community and in the academic spheres, what are your opinions on the role of new music, what it should be, what it is, in community involvement and community education? That's a great question. Who wants to, I certainly have thoughts, but why don't we start uh, with... I, I can say something yeah. about, I think that, uh, I mean, I, as a person who's very heavily involved with new music and commissioning, uh, I'm always uh, uh, amazed how when I suggest contemporary music on programs, um, the first reaction I get from the presenters or from my managers is, ooh, ooh really? Um, and then uh, when I start playing it, well, for instance, I often play Boulez, that's the piece that the audience likes the most. I think it's, it's, it's in some way, it has a lot to do with how, how contemporary music is presented, uh, what the commitment of the performer is, too. So often we are taught and have been uh, not actually even taught contemporary music very much uh, uh, because we focus so much on traditional things that the way people often approach contemporary music is eh, nobody knows it anyway so I don't have to really play it all that well and everybody can tell in the end the commitment is not there and the language the skill isn't there so I think the commitment of the of the performer and the way that they present it is, is great and the fact is that um, if you're talking about presenting uh, contemporary music in a community, it's creating something new. And going back to other disciplines, I think if you're part of a new choreography or if you watch somebody make a painting, it's nothing but exciting. And it doesn't have to be any different with being part of uh, the creative process of a composer. That's a great, that's a great point. I mean, we have in Peabody, we have, we're so fortunate to have a fantastic composition department, actually, and, and, it, and it is, you know, I think that um, it's something that we've been talking about: is how do we, how do we, how do we access this even more in terms of contemporary music? And I think the the question of how it relates to the community. I mean, I I ran a major orchestra and, and grappled with this this very question all the time about how you balance programming, and it's a very challenging issue. But I will say that I think that when presented in the right way and with commitment and with love and 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 people. Be, welcoming people into the experience. Um, and I must say also that, that, you know, I've seen so many times where the, where the, it's most welcomed in the community, in the schools. I mean, kids are actually remarkably open because they don't have preconceived notions about what music is. And so they're, they're in, in many ways, the most open audience to, to new ideas. I, I think young, young people, though, too, are, are much more, I mean, it's much easier to build a bridge from a piece that you wrote to you know someone who's 25 than it is to build a bridge from Beethoven 5 to somebody who's 25 in my experience anyway so it depends you know who you're who you're appealing trying to appeal to but I, I think there's a lot of room I, I don't think contemporary music in Baltimore has even started to come into its own I think it's a whole area that that could um, could reflect the incredible visual arts that are expanding and expounding and, and, and going wild here. I think there, and I think there's really probably a huge um, appetite for it if, if packaged right. Thomas? Actually, this is completely um, off top. Well, it's not really off topic, but when you mentioned Boulez, I heard a funny story about Pierre Boulez the other day, which I just, it'll take a minute, okay? <laughs> so when you're in the recording studio, there's certain phrases that people use, you know, like when you're, you're tracking, you punch in, you know, you see, there's certain phrases that become sort of memes, you know? And, and there was this one particular one, I'm not gonna tell you what it is till the end or I'll blow my punchline, but um, I asked an engineer if he knew where this phrase had, had uh, originated from. He said, actually, yeah, I do. So Pierre Boulez was in London, at, I think the Festival Hall, uh, conducting the London Symphony Orchestra, and as you know, relations between my country and our neighbours across the 
channel have not always been that good. Uh, but so Pierre Boulez is conducting the London Symphony Orchestra, and they're doing a piece of Schoenberg or, or, or Bruckner or something, something fairly um, didactic, and he's got a big orchestra, what's a big orchestra, 96 pieces or something, and they're in rehearsal, and halfway through a movement, he stops the orchestra, and he looks at the, the back and he says, uh, oboe number three, I think you'll find you're a little bit flat. And there's a silence and from somewhere else in the back comes, well fucking spotted Pierre. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in recording studios in London, right, if you stop a band in the middle of a take, right, and, and the producer goes, I think that kick drum was just like a little bit late, you know, somebody will go, well fucking spotted Pierre. <laughs> It's a good story. <laughs> and yes, Boulez can do that. It's very true. <laughs> Other, another question up here. Uh, so I kind of came up here not really with a question, more of um, an idea of what I, what I would really like to hear us talk about. I'm so glad one of my colleagues brought up the idea of new music as someone who I am so avidly passionate about new music and I want to make my career in it. And it's kind of uncommon. And it's, it's really disheartening to me when I'm talking to a colleague and I hear, I don't like music after 1950. I don't like to play that. And it's astounding to me. And I think that there's a lot of, there's this idea that we're gonna get out of college and you're gonna have the performing career that you want. That's really unrealistic. Um, and I, I still have the privilege of studying with Gary Liu and also with Steve Rainbolt. Um, and Gary brought in someone from a big time recording um, business and talking about how you know, we have someone who wants to you know, make another CD of Bach or another CD of Schumann. Well, there are 500 other people out there who can do the same thing. What makes you so special? Um, I, I want to see what your opinion about is like the diversity of what we do and, and kind of implementing the idea of new music and what makes you special as a musician instead of having this idea of I'm going to get out of college and have a a career performing, you know, on the Met, the stage of the Met. I just kind of wanted to bring that idea of like, well, how can we make what we play more diverse and that idea of going out there? Sorry, it's so like vague. Well, you know, the, the, the uh, I remember my parents uh, had a quartet and they were rehearsing. I was about 10 and they were rehearsing this quartet and it was really dissonant and, and it was on my nerves and the dog was, you know, let's say. <laughs> and I came down afterwards to, out of my room, and I said, oh, yeah, I really hate new music. And my mom said, oh, that was Beethoven, gross a few. <laughs> no, but seriously, if you think about it for a second, and you've never heard that piece, and you suddenly hear people playing it, it's unreal what he was thinking. And that sort of transformed the way I thought about I thought, you know, I'm in that moment where Beethoven sounds brand new to me. And so Beethoven really was new music once. And I think the way to um, create a connection for young musicians is by teaming them with young composers. Because for me, I also was very hesitant about new music until I started, when I was about 17, I started playing um, Somebody wrote me into going to Soho every week down from Yale, and I met this guy, Steve Reich, and started playing some of his music. And I used to go down there every week, and you know, I thought, this is so stupid, you know, it's so bad. And you know, maybe it was the Potter stuff, but I started really enjoying it. I don't know, but you know, it's. Uh, but I, I, I had a connection with him then, you know, and then I met some other guys and Phil Glass and all these, you know, people doing things and interesting things and I think when you're a musician and you start playing the music of a living composer and start connecting with them it brings you into it's again everything in life is about a relationship whether it's from the stage to the audience or from a musician to a composer and creating those opportunities for the young musicians to connect you have a great composition department here but I would like to see more more um, engagement all, all the time and, and just as part of the curriculum. Um, we oh, have, yeah. uh, just to tout our own horn, we, we actually commissioned the composition students to write for our flute students and we do world premiere projects every year. It's our third year this year 
and starting to do it in Germany and have the German composers also be played here and the American composers be played there. So I think it's often in the reign of great. the interest of each person to do and it's a, it's a great thing. And I wanted to say some, two things actually. One, you said, why should I um, record Bach? I, I wasn't sure I was understanding you, but what makes me so special? And that's precisely the point. You should be special for yourself. You should be so convinced and you should come out with such a strong voice that you do think you're special and you work at it. You, you, you become skillful at what you do, at your craft even. Uh, and then the artistry as well. And then you are special. And then it doesn't matter what the repertoire is. It can be Bach, it can be Buxtehude, it can be um, Elliot Carter. You have a voice and I think that's really the key of, of, of an institution is to empower the students to have an intelligent, unique voice. Question over here. wondering if we could go back to the topic of music education for kids. Um, we were talking about programs like Orc Kids give uh, children of all backgrounds the opportunity to play an instrument, which is awesome. But um, I'm wondering what you think our responsibility or perhaps actions should be in the role of um, promoting music in public education. Because um, we've talked a lot about um, going out, reaching out to audiences, you know, through technology and innovative performances and things like that. But um, the reality is that while this music is so important for us, because we know it's one of the highest forms of art and it provides an emotional experience that's inco incomparable, but for a lot of people, um, our art form doesn't really exist. They grew up with parents who listen to the Beatles, and they, it's just not part of their lives. Well, the Beatles are awesome, but <laughs> Beethoven you know, and Mozart were never part of their lives. And in the long run, if children were brought up in a society where they learned about Beethoven in history class, or they were all required to take music class rather than music budgets and schools being cut, if kids were brought up with that as part of their culture, they'd be more likely to spend their weekends going to concerts, and we wouldn't have to worry so much about you know, reaching audiences on Twitter, you know. So I'm wondering yeah. if you think we have a responsibility towards that. So, so that's a great question because it gets back to that, that initial, get, gets back to our first question we asked today, which is that how is education, you know, one of, the, one of the premises is, one of our challenges is that education, music education has disappeared from a generation, from the last generation. And it, it's, it's one of the reasons some would argue we find ourselves in a more difficult climate maybe than ever before. Jesse. Um, you know, the short answer to your question is yes. And I think every musician should have, should feel a tremendous sense of responsibility to be an advocate for uh, music education, but actually for arts education. And, you know, uh, education policy is set at the local level. And so uh, it suggests that, you know, effective change will happen when people in music see themselves as part of a broader sector of people who care about the quality of education. It's another reason to kind of get beyond, you know, the kind of hermetic notion that we're advancing the cause of classical music. Um, moving, making change in public education, as we know, is a daunting and huge task. And I think one thing we can, can know for certain is that having individual segments of any community try to advance a cause without building broad coalitions is going to be damned. And so we already have, you know, there's divisiveness among people in music around public education. You've got the music educators advocating for the professional music educators versus the practitioners, the, the musicians and symphony orchestras going into schools. And so, you know, a critical, critical piece of increasing capacity for improving uh, music and arts education in schools will be dependent on our all having a bigger view of what our ultimate goals are. And it kind of goes back again to this question of, you know, if we're in this because we think music is good because it supplies, you know, careers for musicians or we just love classical music, it's great. It's very hard to get a foothold in the policy arena which is concerned with much bigger issues. It has to do usually with the health of communities, with the quality of our society. And so I think for us to think of ourselves as effective advocates for music education, we have to have a broader understanding and a broader, broader sense of what our role is so we can make those partnerships that will be essential to make change. Yes. 
Ben. I would just say yes and. And the and for me is I could argue for you that we're in the golden age of arts education right now because I don't know a kid who doesn't dance, who doesn't write poetry, who doesn't beatbox, who doesn't play a guitar. Who I mean, I don't know a kid who is not artistically expressive. The difference is my generation, someone taught us in the structure of the school day, and now kids teach each other outside of the organized school day. So edu our, arts education has gone from a vertical construct to a horizontal construct where it's collaborative in a way that my generation would have called cheating. On one level, we have to fight to get it back in the classroom, but for me, the more interesting question is, if there's such ripe horizontal education going on now, how do we insert ourselves into that tsunami of artistic training that's going on? Because my experience is, if a professional musician comes up to a kid and says, I know how to play that, kids are gonna say, come on in. And the thing about, let's fight the school board to get it back, okay, yeah, we need to. But meanwhile, a whole wave of possibility we're not paying attention to. I'm a big advocate of, you know, just um, just do it, even if they tell you you can't. Um, you know, it's, and, and if you just, I don't know, you know, I, if I start thinking about the school board and uh, education in America, really, I just want to crawl into bed again, you know, and just give up. I, I just never think about those things. I, I, if you'd like to join us at ORCIDS at any moment, you know, when we started, we didn't even, we didn't even know how to do this, you know. We just and we just found the only principal that would let us in the building, and that's where we started. And you know, it's it's something everybody talks about it because they're bu building consensus and policy and blah. And meanwhile, we just went and did it. And you know, the great thing here is that you have an institution like Johns Hopkins, who it's an institution that understands. It, it has a social responsibility to the community. So we're talking a lot about the new school, the elementary school, public school that Johns Hopkins built in um, East Baltimore, Henderson Hopkins. And so here's an opportunity for us all to collaborate to create sort of a mecca for um, city, city kids about music. So come and join us and let's be part of finding a solution. And you know, if you create something that's so compelling it's like what Dr. Abreu did in Venezuela. I mean, nobody noticed it, by the way, for 40 years. So you have to be patient, <laughs> yeah. you know? But suddenly everybody thinks it just sprang up overnight. But my, my charge to you is to say, you know, get a bunch of people and let's go. Let's just change it. Question over here. Lots of questions. <laughs> um, I'm currently a master's student um, doing voice performance, and I'm also doing a teaching certificate to accumulate more skills and be able to share more music. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts about how um, classical vocal music and opera have been changing, and what, as a vocal student, we need to be prepared for for the future and responsible for. Okay, so uh, now you're a big opera fan. Oh, I'm a huge opera fan. Yeah. I'm a huge opera fan. I mean, the obvious answer, of course, is we know about how performance is changing is with, with emphasis on a different kind of uh, uh, digital communications, their new emphasis on appearance, weight. Uh, I, I'm being, you know, real about this, uh, about the use of amplification in the hall, so maybe the voices don't need to be as big. So there are different kinds of both opportunities but changes that are, that are afoot there that I, I don't know how this is all going to shake out, to be totally frank. You know, I, I, it's clear that it's changing, but I don't know what the, the ultimate handwriting on the wall is. You all probably know. Well, well, you know, we, we had started off sp speaking also about different venues and different ways of presenting music, and I, I think I brought up at the beginning that I heard the, the Pierre Rollinaire in, in the Kabuki style. Actually, it was parallel, both, both Western and Eastern performances going on. And it made me realize that, I mean, I've, I'm a huge opera fan, and one of the big things, I, I even only play the flute because of opera, uh, is, is the fact that you can uh, express in a dramatic role in a different way. So through opera, you're actually blending already at least two art forms, if not more, at the same time. So speaking about taking charge and doing things, going to new venues, creating new ideas, creating with composers. I think the, that the possibilities for the opera world are staggering, actually, that you, what you can do with interactive and then with technology and all of that. So I don't know what the, what the I never know what the future is. Um, 
I think it's a good idea to have good pitch, by the way, because uh, with all the contemporary music, uh, <laughs> you don't want to have somebody giving you the, the, the note just before you sing. <laughs> I, I, I think we are, with that, we are just about at the end of our time. I'm going to ask for one very quick wrap-up from the panel. Just two what, very quick thoughts as we go around. Ben. You're speechless? Yeah, well, I, I wasn't expecting this question. I mean, I guess Sorry. basically, I raised the idea of the Reformation earlier. I think for people that are brave enough to rethink what's going on, we're on the verge, not of a Reformation, but of a Renaissance. Thomas? I'm kind of tired of hearing that music is a luxury, you know, that in good et economic times we can afford a luxury like music in schools and performance spaces and so on. Music is not a luxury. It's, it's been proven over and over again. This is an absolutely fundamental part of life. And why do we have to focus on science, math, all the rest of the things? Why don't we, why don't we just in, accept and embrace the fact that learning and playing music as a kid, as you, as you grow into a, an adult, makes you a better world citizen? Music is not a luxury. Marin? Uh, don't forget that uh, you are the most privileged of people because you get to do what you love and hopefully make a living doing what you love. That's what I hope for for my child. That's great. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm on the same path in a way. I think that um, music is a passion and everybody here is probably very passionate about it and so hard work I think is, a, is not a bad thing, it's a great thing. It's, it is a privilege to be able to work very hard at what you do so that you excel and become the best that you can be. And I think what we are hearing in every way is about communication in whichever way, whichever form that takes you. Jesse. Um, IBM has as its slogan, think, and uh, Nike has as its slogan, just do it. So kind of two, two opposite ways of being in the world. And um, I think they both make sense. And I think as you uh, think about your futures, what would matter most to me is that you uh, reinvent our next, you know, our, our, our next chapter of what music making in America is about. We, uh, we're, we've all been around the block a few times. And I think it's, it's, it's time uh, for you to take hold and figure it out. Thank you. I, I think that there is a, um, we're in an institution here that is 157 years old, as everybody knows. It is, it is the oldest conservatory in the United States, which gives us a remarkable platform, if you think about it. Uh, that, along with the fact that we are part of one of the greatest research universities in the world, and I would say actually are in one of the most rapidly and interesting communities in many, many ways. So I put all of those things together I look at our history, I look at the challenges and some of the things that are out there, and then I look at the opportunity, and I think that we, we, are, we are positioned, Peabody is positioned to, I think, be a leader in how we think about these things going forward, and um, I look forward to doing that with everyone here. I want to thank the panel, great, com great conversation from all of you, and, uh, and thank all the great, for all the great questions, and thank you all for being here. We're also going to continue this, uh, we have a reception in, uh, in Joe Bird Hall, and uh, we invite everybody there and continue the conversation informally. Thanks for coming. Well done, Fred.